We're looking at lesson eight of series three. And 11, 8 to 14, we're going to go back a little bit and cover some, some area that we did read about a bit. But we're going to go deeper. This is the death, resurrection, ascension, and the earthquake that happens upon the ascension of the prophets into the heavens. 11, 8 to 14, uh, and uh, always with the guidance of Elder Athanas. So let's read the scriptural passage as usual, and then we'll talk just really quickly about some anomalies in the King James and jump right into the text. Ketoptoma afton. Επιτις πλατείες της πόλης της μεγάλης, ή της καλύτε πνευματικός σόδομα και Αίγυπτος, όπου και ο Κύριος αυτόν εσταυρώθη, και βλέπωσιν εκ των λαών και φιλών και κλωσών και εθνών το πτώμα αυτών, ημέρες τρεις και ήμισι. Και τα πτώματα αυτών ουκ αφήσωσι τεθήνε εις μήμα και οι κατοικούντες επί της γης χαίρωσιν επ' αυτής και εφρανθήσονται και δώρα πέμψουσιν αλλήλεις, ότι ούτε οι δύο προφήτε ευασάνησαν τους κατοικούντες επί της γης. Και μετά τους τρεις ημέρες και ήμιση πνεύμα ζωής εκ του Θεού εισήλθεν εις αυτούς και έστεισαν επί τους πόδες αυτών, και φόβος μέγας επέπεσαν επί τους θεωρούντες αυτούς και οίκουσα φωνήν μεγάλην εκ του ουρανού λέγωσιν αυτής ανάβητε όδε και ανέβησαν εις τον ουρανόν εν την εφέλη και θεώρησαν αυτούς οι εχθροί αυτών και εκείνη την ημέρα έγινε το σεισμός μέγας και το δέκατον της πόλης έπεσε και απεκτάνθησαν εν το σεισμό ονόματα ανθρώπων χιλιάδες επτά, και λυπή έμφοβοι εγένοντο και έδω και να δόξουν το Θεό του ουρανού, και ουέ η δευτέρα απειώθεν, η ουέ η τρίτη ειδού έρχεται ταχύ. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves in the tomb. And they, dwell, they that dwelt upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth, dwelt on the earth. And after three days and half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of, of men seven thousand, and their remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Okay, just briefly, some small differences in the second part of the text. We've already talked about the underlined portions in the Greek and the and the portions that are in italics in the King James. A minor difference in 1115. Well, we're not even, I'm sorry. We're not even there yet. That's in the next section. So the only the only section, the only day um, uh, passage really that has any serious differences are 11.12 and 11.13, and it's instead of they heard in 11.12, it should be I heard, ikusa is what it says in the Greek, and then in 11.13, instead of our, it should be they, 
the same day. And it's very strange. I don't know, just different manuscripts, but there really is no excuse for the differences in terms of the translation for the King James, but not a huge uh, error uh, again. All right, so let's go to the uh, line by line uh, analysis uh, that we're going to be doing. And their dead bodies, let's remind ourselves the first verse eight we're looking at, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, the term in the Greek is ptoma, uh, which they translated as dead bodies, uh, but it's more appropriate corpse. And you remember that in our Orthodox New Testament, they have even something different, which is a bit strange. Uh, and they have um, their fall, to ptoma, and they interpret it as the fall. Not really quite sure. Well, they fell to the ground. They they fell dead. But uh, corpse is uh, is how the elder understands it. Uh, use of the term corpse shows the fury and hatred of the beast for the two prophets. Uh, and their corpses, moreover, the ex exhibition of those corpses, which continues for three and a half days in the center plaza of the city, depicts the extreme humiliation of the prophets. Where does that happen, where they leave the corpses there? Not because they're in the middle of a war and there's no one who can bury the bodies, but because they intentionally want to humiliate these bodies and expose them for the whole world to see, and the whole world will be watching, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, their ill treatment at the hands of the Antichrist will have severe consequences for the marginal, lukewarm Christians. Let me see if I can just correct that. I think maybe I know the, the problem here. We'll see. Let's see if we can make it even darker. Let's see. Is that better? I don't know. I'm not sure if that's any better, but hopefully. Um, so let's go on to the second slide. And their dead bodies, again, looking at this phrase. The first consequence will be that the nominal Christians, those who panic very easily and are victimized by cowardice. We're going to talk about cowardice. The first consequence being cowardice here of this, uh, this theoma, this vision this, 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 that everyone will be looking at from the entire world. And they will lose heart. And this is a most terrible sin. A lot of people don't realize just how bad this sin is. We will go to Revelation um, a bit later in the in the text. Uh, we'll see that it's the first of the of the several very severe sins that are listed of those who go to the place where the, that burns with fire and brimstone, the second death. They have the all the immoral, they have all the sorcerers, but first and foremost, they have the cowards. And this is to show and to stress to the reader just how bad this sin is. Because is there anything worse than having no faith and trust and courage in the stance of Christ? And according to, uh, you know, in front of Christ to not trust, to lose heart and to change on being, uh, and upon being threatened or being uh, full of fear to lose heart and to walk away from Christ. There's little that can be done with that kind of lack of trust and, and faith. And so God protect us uh, from this cowardice. And uh, not a few uh, people have commented in our day that there is a great amount of this in the world today, another sign of our times, that we don't have people who are ready to go to war, as it were, spiritually for the truth. And that so many are the, are lukewarm. So many uh, are talking about a love which is not love at all, but it's a kind of excuse for avoiding conflict and 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 uh, uh, fleshly love. So we need to take stock of ourselves. We need to use uh, allow the events of our day to, to to take our temperature spiritually and say, how am I doing with this whole question of trust, faith, and 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 boldness? for our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. How much do I have? How much do I really? So if, if something happens, let's say, suddenly, I don't know, you're, you're locked in a room 
and the and there's no there's no electricity. What and you realize that you're filled with fear. That is a sign that something's wrong. Uh, or whatever the day to day events you find, you immediately are filled with fear and cowardice, and you're you don't want to go out. You're afraid who who's coming, who's what. All of this kind of immediate loss of peace and trust, and not having consciousness of God and prayer, is a as my Yero that used to say, Kabanaki, it's a, the bell is ringing. God is allowing you to see yourself so that you might take measures and not continue in that cowardice. So uh, let's not belittle it. It's very serious. We see, we see this in the scriptures as well. If we go to the gospels, let's see what we can learn there. The question of trust and faith and and boldness you will fall it's we see it the, the temptation for the apostles right he says not only to peter but all the apostles you will all fall away this night for it is written i will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered and it's not only the apostle peter who says no no no, no i'm, I'm going to be faithful who of course denied christ but all of them said that and they all fled and they were fearful of the Jews. It says after the three days waiting before the resurrection, for fear of the Jews, which of course meant the powers that be, right? The, the, the rulers of the people. For fear of the Jews, who those Jews who were not, they, of course, they were the apostles were Jews. So we're not talking about every Jew. We're talking about the authorities. That's what that means. The Jewish authorities who had not received and accepted and embraced Christ. And that, that is, unfortunately, very obvious today in the church. We are afraid of the powers of this world, and we run to them to have their support. Or the worldly among us, we run to the worldly among us, even if they're clergy. And we say, you know, don't upset them. Let's not upset the bishops, the priests, the, 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 the parish council, you know, uh, let's not upset the money people, whatever it is, right? Just apply it to whatever part of your life. Not for the sake of truth, not for, we're afraid to lose something that is dear to us. Our own life, of course, first and foremost, to be harmed, lose our income, our good name, whatever it is. All of that is a sign that we're not ready to stand and confess, and we're not going to do well in the days of the Antichrist. This is, these are, these are, this is the time to take account and, and repent and make, make amends and start to get serious about confessing Christ first and foremost. It happens to us all the time. And it will happen then too. They'll see the prophets dead, slaughtered, I mean, brutally killed by the Antichrist, right? And they're going to lose hope. They'll think they've lost the contest. And they say, well, the prophets lost? The, the people of God, two, two and a half years we saw them, and now they're dead? Well. All, all, all is lost. And they'll say nothing has been accomplished. We've lost everything. The prophets, if, the, if our prophets, the prophet Elias, who was the army for the people of God, right? He was the army. The, he, there was nothing else for the people. Of God. He was the army. Now he's dead. What are you going to do? Are you going to lose hope? They will say we admire the prophets, like the like the Lord, like the apostles said to the Lord. No, 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 we're not going to deny you. We're going to say the same thing about the prophets. We're with you. We're going to praise them. They're going to be ready to follow them. But once they have become the object of the Antichrist's revenge, they will give it all up immediately. Once they see the power of this world inflicted, and God, of course, allowing that. See, this is what people forget. Nothing is an accident. Not one thing. There is no luck in this world. There is no accidents. Everything is God's providence. Or allowed by him, or wished, desired by him, katevdokian, his good pleasure, or kataparahorisi in Greek, or that which is allowed by God. So there's no accidents in life, right? We forget that, and then we lose heart. We think that what we see and the powers of this world, which are very limited at the end of the day, cannot reach and take the soul, uh, are more powerful than God. We forget, and this is a very, very dreadful, awful reality they will end up denying their faith 
They will lose heart to the point where they will walk away and not trust God anymore. So there will be many, according to the elder, in this category. Not few, many. And then in 18.8 in Luke, we read about our Lord's prophecy of the end times. What does he say? He says about those Christians of the end times, nevertheless, will when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That will be a characteristic of the end times. The lack of trust, cowardice, all the rest. Right? That's If he asked that, that's a point. We, he's making a point here. This is the way it's going to be at the end. Nominal Christians will be scandalized, seeing what they will believe to be God's abandonment in Adina. Is it possible? God's abandonment of the two prophets, just as previously, many were scandalized when they saw the Messiah on the cross, right? They were scandalized. How and it will be in a similar way for the prophets. I wonder why at that time the elder asked, I wonder why they the people who were scandalized with the cross, they didn't remember the prophets, especially Isaiah, who wrote about the suffering of the Messiah. Why? Why did they avoid that? They knew it, they knew very well about the prophets. Even the apostles were shaken and didn't remember, weren't paying attention. Didn't want the Messiah to suffer. So this is a particular scandal. Right? This is a scandal for the world. This message of the gospel, the, of the sacrifice. And we already see this. We've seen this in the world, this scandal of the cross. Let's talk about the three types of scandals. There's three types. He talks a lot about elder Athanasius in many talks, talks a lot about the scandals because we see them so much in our day. There's three types of scandals that people fall into. There's the scandal of the cross. People are not able to accept, rather. The scandal of the cross, the scandal of history, and the scandal of monasticism. And we're not going to talk about the third one. Just to remember, according to St. Eustin Popovich, anti-monastic sentiments are indicative of the loss of orthodoxy, and the distortion of the orthodox tradition of purification, illumination, and theosis. So if people, if you or anyone you know or people in the church are scandalized by monastic life, in other words, they have a trouble accepting that as actually the evangelical ideal. And they are like, I don't know, this whole monasticism doesn't make sense. It's not... They, that they means they have a loss of orthodox ethos and phronima. It means they have not understood the cross and the ascetic life. So that's a third kind of scandal that we see because monasticism is, is par excellence the crucifixion of the old man. It's the cross uh, in, 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 an, in, in a way of life that we all are called to. It's just that this is more intensified and in a way that's organized uh, let's see, more efficiently to achieve the same ends that we all have, right? And that is to pick up our cross and follow up to Christ. So let's talk about the scandal of the cross. The rulers of the people scoffed. Remember this when he was on the cross, right? How can the Messiah allow people to crucify him on the cross? Is God abandoning him? This is what people will say. Where is God? And they say this all the time today already. Where is God in Ukraine? Why isn't he stopping this war? Where is God in, in the, the murder of millions of unborn babies? Where is God in, in, in the world today with all this war and destruction and sin? And where is God? They, they, they've been saying it, and they'll be saying it up until the second coming. And they said it in front of the cross, especially that scandal to the Jews. How could the Messiah be crucified? And of course, Islam, millions, what, a billion something? What is it? I don't, I don't know what the numbers of Islam Muslims are in the world, they can't accept the cross. They reject the cross of Christ. They are among the worst of all heretics throughout the whole history of the church. This heresy of Islam is called a heresy by St. John of Damascus because it rejects the cross of Christ. No, 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 it's impossible. It didn't happen. They, were, they refused to accept that it happened. Uh, they don't believe the scriptures are true. It's, a, it's quite amazing. And the, the rulers scoffed and said he cannot save himself. 
Why doesn't he come down from the cross and show us and prove to us that he's the Messiah, right? In the same way, in those years, they'll see the prophets and they'll wonder why God has abandoned them. And they see the righteous people throughout church history that are persecuted. Uh, and they probably asked in the days of many of our saints, well, how is it possible that this saint is persecuted? This saint is martyred, is exiled. Uh, saint Nectarios, how, how could people treat Saint Nectarios? Bishops of the church, patriarchs t t treated Saint Nectarios, a holy man, with such disdain. And, and even at the end of his life, had an amazing temptation with the Archbishop of Athens, Miletios Metexakis, according to historical witness, that accused him of sexual impropriety. And is, is it possible? Saint Nectarius, who became the great saint of our century, well, was recognized. Right there, you can see the two sides of 20th century orthodoxy, right? Apostate, Masonic, ecumenist, deluded of this world, and the holy, meek, humble, suffering pastor and monastic leader who whose relics worked untold miracles. Right there, you can see that unbelievable right in that snapshot of history so they see the saints they see the righteous within history and they wonder why god abandons them and i love this quote from elder athanasius he says the gospel of comfort does not exist there is no gospel of comfort let me comfort you in your and make life easy and the broad way that does not exist there's no good news preaching comfort right actually the good news is the cross the good news is you will be you have to be crucified with Christ in order to be resurrected. That's that's the good news. And, and people who are running from suffering will meet it anyway in their lives. No one will escape suffering. The question is, what suffering do you want to embrace? That which is redemptive? That which purifies? Or do you want to embrace the suffering that never ends? The suffering of not having communion with God. The suffering of not having the grace of God. That's the question. And it's, it's, it's really... Uh, a, a obvious that we embrace the cross and we are freed from the suffering that never ends and we're freed from the suffering that comes from the lack of communion with God. The true gospel is a gospel of martyrdom. We are left to wonder how many will endure this scandal of the cross. So that is that is the basic and first and uh, most basic scandal that the world uh, cannot, uh, get around right the scandal of the cross but there's also a scandal of history where is god in history why doesn't he intervene doesn't god see what's happening where is christ uh we used that example actually earlier uh in the, in the beginning of our look at the scandal of the cross so it probably was not as appropriate obviously now uh, then as now but this is also a scandal to many the scandal of history occurs when we see evil reign and triumph within history but do not see the direct intervention of God, right? So uh, this is one of the temptations we talked about yesterday, the temptation of running after uh, and trying to uh, bring about a triumph within history, uh, you know, having a Christian government that uh, overcomes the evil uh, government of the Antichrist or something like this, and that's a temptation. And that's what we want. We want we want to see God bring a heaven on earth, a utopia. That's always an, that's the temptation of the end times that many will fall into, including, of course, Christians. So we see here that there's three kinds of reactions, isn't there? Different event, same same event, but different results. Uh, we have this these prophets who are slaughtered and their their dead bodies are there. Their corpses are there. And we have three different kind of reactions. We have the reaction of the impious. The impious rejoice the defeat of the righteous. We have the reaction of the pious. The, they understand the cross. They're cross-centered. They glorify God with hope and expectation. They await Christ. They want nothing uh, of a worldly glory, but they want the glory that is never-ending. And they expect Christ to come, and they wait on Christ. And then there's the lukewarm Christians the faithless ones, the fearful ones, who lose heart, and 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 they and they end up falling away from Christ. Uh, they're the they're the lukewarm. They're the most pathetic, the most tragic. God forbid that we are among them. 
Now, is this Jerusalem, this great city, right? We heard about this great city here in which all this is taking place. Is it geographical or is it allegorical? And we have allegorical examples. We have Babylon. At the time when the, the apostle was writing this, Babylon did not exist as an empire. So it was obviously, and it could only be understood as allegorical. It referred mainly to Rome. They used the term Babylon for all anti-God uh, powers. And in Revelation 17, 6, we have, he saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Now, that is that that martyrdom, that, that, that bloodthirsty revenge of the pagan Roman emperors on the Christians is, is, is also referred to as the contemporary Babylon. So all anti-God, anti-Christ forces can be referred to as Babylon. But this is not possible here for Jerusalem. We do talk about Jerusalem generally as the city of God or the or those people of God, but this is actually not possible in this passage. Listen to what St. Andrew of Caesarea says. And he will abandon their bodies unburied in this Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem, the one which has been destroyed, the same one in which the Lord suffered. So clearly the, 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 the great interpreter, St. Andrew, uh, says this is a the city. This is actually a physical city. It's going to be a physical place. Everything is going to be geographical and not allegorical. He goes on and he says, it seems that in this city, they will rise from a royal house an imitation, uh, there will there will rise from a royal house an imitation of David the king, from whose God's son Christ, our true God, was born in the flesh, so that he, the Antichrist, can convince the Jews that he is fulfilling the prophetic word, which is that I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen, and I will set it up. So obviously, uh, the, apost the uh, saint here is saying this is this is necessarily Jerusalem. Because in this place is where the Antichrist himself will come to convince the Jews that he is fulfilling the prophetic word, the rebuilding of the temple. And everyone knows, I think anybody who spent any time looking at the book of Revelation and the end times, and you don't even have to spend much time, uh, just listen to what the, the various sectarian Protestants say. And they're fixated on this question of when and if soon the temple will be built. This is clearly a sign of the coming of the Antichrist, I don't know how they interpret it, but that's how we interpret it, and that he will uh, he will promise and give this promise and 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 work toward this end. So he he will do this in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he will try to convince the Jewish people that he is the fulfilling the prophecy of David by settling in Jerusalem. He will tell them that he has come to fulfill the prophecy, which calls for the resurrection of the fallen temple of David and restoring what it was what was destroyed in it. He is certainly not going to deceive the Jewish people if he goes to New York or Melbourne or wherever, right? Luxembourg. It's not going to happen. He's got to be in Jerusalem. The Antichrist will do this in the specific geographical city of Jerusalem. Thus, a metaphor does not apply in this case. And there are four reasons quickly to go through, just in case uh, you're, uh, you've, been, you've heard or you're tempted by other uh, interpretations. There's very... Clear, there's four basic reasons why, and we'll talk about them briefly. First, the whole scenery of the vision with the measuring of the temple refers to this specific city. Very important. It wasn't some other city. It wasn't some other temple. It was the temple in the city of, uh, and that's the, the uh, context. So second, this great city is characterized as both Sodom and Egypt. We'll, we'll explain why, why that's this great city it has to be Jerusalem. Third, the clear observation that the two prophets will be put to death in the same city where the Lord was crucified. And fourth, the spiritual state of Jerusalem at the time will be like that of Sodom and Egypt. Now let's unpack each one of these. The first one, this great city. We see that the Antichrist is rebuilding the temple, which would certainly not be that temple used to hold catechisms. Uh, for instance, the Church of the Resurrection. In the time of St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century, when he's given his catechetical lectures, he says clearly, and he points to the temple, the Orthodox temple, he says, no, 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 never in the temple of God, this temple. It will have to be, obviously, the temple of Solomon, which will be, which had been destroyed, and this will be the temple the Antichrist will build, and not in any other city but Jerusalem. Uh, so this is a sign, and the, of course the sectarian Protestants are right. This is a sign 
uh, and it will help us discern the times. When we see the temple being rebuilt, that's we know what's happening. It's very clear where, where we're at. Number two, this great city is characterized as both Sodom and Egypt. Due to its historical significance, Jerusalem is the city out of which came the Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth. It is the city therein wherein Christianity, the church, was born. The great city of Jerusalem is additionally described as Sodom and Egypt for the simple reason that the prophets themselves use these names for Jerusalem. So we read that Jerusalem, uh, uh, of Jerusalem that all of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah in Je Jeremiah 23, 14. So the Lord and his prophets refer to those that reside in Jerusalem in this way. And the, event, the evangelist, moreover, describes the great city of Sodom allegorically, uh, as Sodom allegorically, and he means Jerusalem, not another city. So there's many witnesses in the prophets, in the evangelists, in the, in, the, in the fathers. Number three, the, pro, the two prophets will be put to death in this city. And St. Andrew of Caesarea says, the city will be Jerusalem because the Antichrist will seek to settle there in order to show again that he is the awaited Messiah. So it's a well-known fact the Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. All these factors indicate the great city of Jerusalem. And finally, the spiritual state of Jerusalem. Why, is it, why will it be like Sodom? It will be like Sodom simply because there will be much sin, very much sin. And why like Egypt? Well, it is a metaphor. Egypt is a metaphor and refers to the torture of the Israelites for 430 years. They made them suffer greatly in Egypt. They forced them to make bricks, kept them in hard labor, building constantly in order to break them and keep them weak because they felt threatened. At some point, they began to drown Israel's male children in the Nile River. And now listen to this. As Israel had suffered at the hands of the Egyptians, this is how the new Israel the church will also suffer at the hands of the old Israel, which is why the great city is described as Egypt. The new Israel will suffer at the hands of the old Israel. Think about that in a minute. Very interesting. What will those Jews who are uh, Zionists do with that? Have they thought about that? I don't know what they're going to do with that. 11.8. Uh, now let's let's look at that title is actually probably not correct. So forgive it. Forget that title over there. But let's we're going to go into this question now of the anti-Christian agenda. The persecution of the Christians in these days, the way that it goes on, and this is very, very important. The media is used to corrupt, as we all know. This is the elder talking in 1982. He says, the quality of entertainment, the state of our politics, the economy, the system of education, all have been instituted and infected by anti-Christian masterminds. The media is in the hands of anti-Christian masterminds. He says, they have accomplished their goals for the most part. This is in 1982. What would he say today? Brainwashing is not a term that would be used inappropriately here. The main goal is to beat the nations, to beat them down, right? To beat them down. Like a fisherman beats an octopus in the hard rock to make it soft. He just pummels it again and again and again. To paralyze the nations. To paralyze the nations. Then the Antichrist will come and proclaim, I am here to save you. I am your savior. You, you've been paralyzed. You've been beaten down. You've been brainwashed. You've been, you've been uh, manhandled. You've been abused. You've been wars and all the rest. And now I'm coming to save you from all of your we weariness, which, of course, the forerunners of Antichrist worked very hard to bring about. After all these those years of propaganda, the nations will not be able to react at all. And in their despair, they will welcome the idea of a one world government or, and, and a ruler. 
I think this is pretty amazing from Elder Athanasius here. The anti-Christian agenda will have done its work quite well in order to make the nations kneel to this degree, which is why Jerusalem is described as Sodom and Egypt. As Sodom, to corrupt the world, to corrupt the world and as Egypt, to maintain power by propagating a corrupt and corrupting lifestyle. So a corrupt and corrupting lifestyle ultimately has one aim, for people to be ruled over and controlled. If people who are fighting against socialism or against wokeism or whatever the ism is, only understood that when they give themselves over to the mass media, to Hollywood, they're enslaving themselves. They're enslaving themselves to Egypt and Sodom. If one pays a little attention here, he will see how well the words of this text point to this terrible reality. This terrible reality. So now let's look at how is it possible for the whole world to gaze upon the dead bodies and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies, their corpses, three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies, their corpses to be put in the tomb or in the graves. So this expression is very important here. It really, it's really telling us a lot, but maybe we don't understand it immediately. First of all, it means that this is a universal event. Revelation is a universal book. It's talking about a universal event and time. It's not a local one. It's not, it's not something that belongs to the particular ethnic group or geographical area. It's for the entire world. So that's why tribes and tongues and nations and people is used to show that it's the whole world is involved. The whole world will gaze at their dead bodies. Now, how is it possible for the whole world to gaze upon dead bodies in Jerusalem? Obviously, before the advent of modern technology, television, internet, it would have been impossible for anybody to interpret this. They would have said, who knows? What, the, what could they possibly be talking about? How can the whole world gaze upon that? Well, today, it's very easy for us to understand that. Everyone can see and understand why with the technology that exists, and indeed, the pictures that you have on the screen here are from Elon Musk's Starlink. I think that's what they call it, Starlink. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. But it is a, 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 a covers the globe with all these points of satellites so that instant communication can take place from one end of the globe to the other. So now it is very easy. And quick seconds, I mean, real time <laughs> with the delay of a few seconds. Like right now, some people are seeing me a few seconds later. That's about it, right? So it's possible all around the world now for everybody to see what's going to happen in Jerusalem. This would have been inconceivable only a few years ago. A sign of the times. I don't know. That's an amazing, amazing sign, an amazing description here. If people are lacking in faith to believe and accept the gospel, what do they do here? This should be an amazing support for all of our faith and trust in God's word and God's revelation in the book of Revelation. It would have been impossible for anybody for thousands of years to understand, and yet here it is. We've arrived at a time when you can see and understand that the whole world is going to gaze upon their dead bodies, right? They're going to stand and be like these foolish people on the left who are at sports stadiums and and uh, are, are are following, you know, with bated breath, the football game that's in overtime or whatever. This is the kind of mass attention that will be focused on the dead bodies in Jerusalem. Everything, uh, or rather, I, what I want to say before I get into this is that According to St. Andrew of Caesarea, the way we understand things, and we just saw an example of that, right? We never could have understood it until the events are starting to come about. And so he says, everything that behold begins to unfold. When it comes to fruition, then it will be understood. So that's an example of St. Andrew, again, 
very accurately saying you won't understand the entirety of the scriptures until the things are happening. And so that was a great example with the gazing upon their dead bodies, right? This is a tremendous example of this inability of previous generations. Now, this phrase, all will gaze, expresses the sentiments of the people of the world who will be watching. The fact that all people will be glued to their televisions, to their internet connections, and gaze at this event perfectly depicts the attitude of spectators eager to witness not only the murder of the two prophets, but also the in, indecent exhibition of their corpse in the city of Jerusalem. And, you know, it's not hard to imagine that. Right now, during this Ukraine war, there's media coming out and it's been banned in most of the western world but if you find it you can find you can find real time you know taking down of of tanks and and soldiers with bombs and and kamikazes and and drones showing it and it's and we're we're getting and we have been been sensit desensitized to the death of human beings and if this massive war that we're expecting comes about, where millions upon millions of people are slaughtered, and certainly a lot of that will be televised, you can imagine why humanity is 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 descending into a barbarian state and blood shedding of blood. They've been totally desensitized to it. They're not going to be shocked. They're going to be intrigued. It's going to be like a. It's going to be like. So many of these video games that kids sit and play, they become totally desensitized to murder and, and killing. So when it happens on their screen in real life, they're not going to turn away in shame or in disgust. They're going to they're going to follow this this drama and, and, and gaze upon it. And and they're and we know that it's not just going to be that they're going to rejoice. Why are they going to rejoice? Let's let's see what that's all about. They're going to. Follow it closely because they want to see the end of these prophets. They want to see their death. They want to not only see it happen, but they want to continually focus on it for three days. Can you imagine this sadistic mentality of many people in the world at that time? It says in Scripture 11.10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. They will rejoice. They will make merry. They will exchange gifts, seeing the death and the slaughter of these prophets, who for two and a half years had spoke to them the words of God, calling them to repentance. And the elder says, what malicious joy. What depth of evil passion through the television through the internet we could say today they will see and rejoice because they disposed of the tormenting sermons of the prophets the prophets piercing sermons torments the conscience of the people finally we're done with them finally we don't have to listen to them we have examples of that it's nothing really that's that's shocking is it we have saint john the baptist who, when they had opportunity to silence his preaching and his calling to repentance of those in power, they sent him, uh, they sent a executioner and took off his head. We have St. John Chrysostom, another example, just two, who spoke the truth to power of his day to the empress who was not living properly, and she exiled him and didn't want to hear his voice of reproof. This is not all that shocking. What's Shocking is they're rejoicing over it. They're celebrating. They're making merry and exchanging gifts. That is another level, I think, of maliciousness. But we want to. We might want to ask, why would they care so much, right? And why would they want so much to have this sermon be done away with? Why do they care so much to kill the prophets and rejoice so much at the death of the prophets at the end of the sermon? If all of these people, most of them, a lot of them, are agnostics, atheists, indifferent, why does the call to repentance bother them so much? Right? Why would a non-believer feel reproached? He could care less. These are a bunch of religious fanatics. I don't believe it anyway. Right? They would say, 
doesn't matter to us. We're beyond the pale. This is, doesn't, it doesn't, we don't believe any of this is true. We don't believe a God exists. We don't believe there's hell. So why are they not, why are they reacting in the whole world? It says the whole world will rejoice. Why? Uh, even though they're not tormented, they're going to persecute the Christians. They're going to go after the prophets. Why is this? It is simply because there is no absolute atheist. Not There's not one real absolute 100% atheist on the face of the earth. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. He made us for himself. He made us to live for him, to be with him, to be in him, and to have our life with him. And so no matter what they do, that image cannot be blackened entirely. They cannot uproot it entirely. And Father Seraphim Rose has some beautiful reflections upon this. That's that's one of the things that, that drives them mad. That there will not be non-being. They will not disappear into, this, into the next world and this cease to exist. No. They have the image of God. They will never cease to exist. And so that... Is still in them, right? In this world. So they're 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 bothered at some level. And some some part of their being is the conscience is not entirely dead. Our the image of God is in every single cell. It's in every part of our being, right? So even with the atheists, there is a fear of God deep within his subconscious. And so when he sees the persecution of the prophets, he is repelled because of that fear. And he rejoices and exercises this persecution precisely to be liberated from the fear that he can't be liberated from. In other words, the image of God in him, speaking to him, his conscience. He wants so much to be free of that even though he doesn't really accept it on an intellectual level, deep down he does accept it. He cannot but accept it. And that drives him to persecute and then to rejoice that supposedly now he's overcome this deep-rooted fear uh, that really maybe God does exist. Maybe there is an eternal hell. Maybe these things, they cannot get totally beyond it. And this is the psychology of the atheist, according to Elder Athanasius. Now, there are two great errors of the atheists, two basic and great errors of the atheists. And it is that they deny the eschatological dimension of history. Right here in this moment, we read of the, of the eschatological dimension of history. It comes and it, it, it hits them in the face, right? Because after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Oh my goodness. There is an eschaton. There is another life. There is eternity. There is a God. There is re the resurrection. It's all true. And that fear that they have to humble themselves and embrace God and, and seek him out and have communion with him that they don't want to, they don't want to admit that they don't want to come to terms with that they know down deep it's true that fear now comes upon them they said is it possible that my whole life has been in vain and I have not I've not embraced what I the meaning of this life and that it's all meaningless for me unless now they have to humble themselves but they're so full of pride and arrogance that that is a massive undertaking at this point right? The triumph of heaven has come, the resurrection of the two prophets, and they struggled to, to accept the eschaton. They can never imagine, nor do they want to believe, that history will come to an end. This is not, this world is not eternal. The pagans believed it was eternal. No, it's coming to an end. There will be an end to this world, an end to history, a new heaven and a new earth. They believe the history existed and will always exist. This is their great delusion. Even as they think, some of them, that the body will just simply go in the grave and not exist anymore. History and the world will always exist. Not really much sense in that. And so the second great error of these 
those atheists, those who will rejoice at the death of the prophets, is the denial of the reality of the resurrection of the dead. Now they have to deal with that too, seeing the prophets arise. All their activities are based on these two denials, these two false assumptions. Again, the first is there's no eschaton. History, there's an end. There's no end to history. There's no judgment. There's no new heaven and earth, right? There's just this world. It goes on forever. All right, that's the first delusion and denial. Second is that there's no resurrection of the dead. People who die are dead. They're gone. Their history. There's no resurrection of the dead. So those two assumptions, beliefs, are about, are the great errors upon which they, they function and, and think and move. And that's why when these prophets and are resurrected and and brought up into heaven they are in total and utter shock and it's on television for the whole world to see god has allowed for this will allow for this that the whole world will be glued to their television for whatever reason much sure, i i can't really understand how that's going to happen of course but this is what the scriptures are showing us that they're going to be it's a continuous present in greek Right, they don't just watch once in a while. They're constantly glued to the television. It says in Greek, and and just when they're finally saying, "Finally, we're you know these 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 three day dead are going to start to stink, and they're dead, and we've been victorious." Oh, there they go. They get on their feet, and it will be absolutely terrifying for the whole world that does not embrace the gospel in Christ. And this whole thing reminds us of the vision of Ezekiel. We go to Ezekiel, and we're going to be hearing it next on, next Friday in the Orthodox Church on Friday night, Great Friday. We hear the prophecy of Ezekiel, right? The bones scattered over the valley, and they come to life, and they stand on their feet. The great prophecy, wonderful, wonderful prophecy. I love that reading there. I, when I back in Greece, we would read that at the end of the great uh, Orthros, and uh, it's such a wonderful, wonderful prophecy. Uh, these prophecies are not exhausted. They're continually relevant from the first to the second coming of our Lord. And here you see another example of that with the prophets that are rose, uh, the dead bones, the dead bodies uh, come back to life. And the fact that the phrase from Ezekiel is taken, it's like St. John telling us, here is the key, my reader. It's in the pocket, my pocket. Look carefully for it and you will find it. So Ezekiel says, see, O man, how the bare bones stood up, complete men ready with flesh, sinews and nerves and bones. The bare bones stood up, they stood up. This is what the, 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 the uh, book of Revelation says, right? It says, they stood upon their feet. And this is exactly how all the men, the people, will be taken out of the tombs and brought to the promised land uh, in, in, in the uh, fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, the poor uh, uh, Jews who don't grasp the resurrection of the dead and the prophecy as it being fulfilled in Christ, they believe that this is the resurrection of the state of Israel return of the Jews to Palestine. And this is what the elder has to say about that. You Here you have an icon of the prophet Ezekiel uh, describing the, the events of the, the bones receiving flesh. And uh, below you have a famous newspaper uh, showing that Israel was born again in Palestine. Uh, God uses history in order to facilitate some historical points, but God is never limited to past history. So it, it is never understood that these are just historical, only historical, but not typological, right? That means they go beyond history, they go beyond the historical context, and they describe salvation, salvation history. They transcend history and extend all the way to the end times because God is not interested in seeing the Jews merely return to Palestine. How limited can you get? God wants to return a certain people to Palestine. What's the point? Obviously, it's not just that. 
this was a small prophecy, but it is of little interest to him. Ultimately, uh, or rather, furthermore, since the return of the Jews to Palestine as a small prophecy has been realized, then more importantly, the greater part of this prophecy, the resurrection of the dead from the tombs will also be realized. If the smaller part, the historical part is realized, how much more the eternal, the eschatological will be realized? And if it's not realized, what's the point of the smaller? This is exactly what, why Christ said, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth. Do not marvel. Do not marvel, he says. Do we marvel? We, many of us struggle to even accept that and believe and, and live on that basis, right? But this is what the Lord, the truth said. The truth spoke and said, here is reality. Reality is that they will hear and come forth. So even though the vision of Ezekiel returns, refers to the return of historical Israel, in reality, the prophecy is in its greater part refers to the resurrection of the dead. It's both and as we always say here on this channel and following Elder Athanasius, it's both and, right? Both and. They stood upon their feet. This is the day of resurrection for foretelling the resurrection of all humanity. Although we know allegorical interpretation like that used by St. Basil the Great in six days of creation, the fact is that the allegory cannot be applied to the verses here, just like it cannot be applied the metaphorical to the city of Jerusalem, neither can the allegorical here uh, in this verse. The Old Testament says, on that day, in, in Zechariah, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Obviously in the Old Testament we have no record of God's feet. So this obviously presupposes the incarnation and was fulfilled in the incarnation because Jesus Christ stood on the Mount of Olives. And this is the meaning of the resurrection. The reality, this is the reality of resurrection for us to stand on our feet. Right? To stand on our feet. That's the phrase here. That's pointing to resurrection. And it's the resurrection of the two prophets. And this is the reason why in the Orthodox Church, we do not kneel or prostrate on Sunday. We Let me repeat that. We do not kneel or prostrate on Sunday. And very clear in the First Ecumenical Council, and again in the Council of Trullo, in Canon, what is that? Uh, 90? Is that 90? Uh, the 20th Canon in First Ecumenical Council, both of them say no kneeling or prostration on Sunday. Why? Why is it so important? Why do people who do it show their great ignorance of what the day of the resurrection is, is in, implying? Because it expresses the resurrection of the dead in a realistic manner and not an allegorical one. It, it's following the reality of the incarnation, the resurrection, and the reality of the two prophets being raised, the reality of the fulfillment of the Zacharias prophecy in, in the Lord and the resurrection of all the dead, as according to the words of the Lord. This is not symbol, allegory. This is the reality. And so we show that reality on Sunday. We participate in it. We physically do our part and participate in the reality that we are standing on two feet and resurrection. So the day of the resurrection, do you live Sunday as the day of the resurrection? Is it, the, is it filled, your, is, is the light of resurrection, the, the reality of the resurrection, the belief in the resurrection, is that what animates your Sunday? I think all of us need to take, take stock and say, how much do I really live my Sunday as the day, the eighth day, and not simply a day for relaxation, going out for a ride in the car, going to eat some pizza or whatever it is that we do on Sunday, which is, of course, a part of our life in this world. But in the midst of that, and before that, what characterizes our spiritual state? What's going on? What are we doing on Sunday? How do we feel? And what do we? How do we celebrate the day of the resurrection, which is every Sunday, not just Pascha? Every Sunday is the day of the resurrection in the Orthodox Church. So, the day of the resurrection has come. The whole world sees it. The atheists, the lukewarm Christians—they're they're they're full of fear. 
and they're and they're saying, Lord, have mercy. What are we going to do now? How are we going to deal with this reality? This is impossible. Great fear fell upon them, which saw them resurrected and standing on their feet. So they saw the resurrection and they were filled with fear. Why? Because that means their state of rebellion is going to last forever if they don't repent. Right? That state of rebellion, that 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 gnashing of teeth that ta- the Lord talks about about what is the state of hell? It's the gnashing of teeth, the conscience bothering you, that deep-seated fear coming up and grabbing you and saying, "Yep, he exists and you have rejected him." And and this is this is the reality. You can't run from God, right? That not wanting to turn and embrace God, that's hell. Right? God is there. He never leaves you. You were made in his image and yet you reject him. That is hell. That's the state of hell for eternity. People have foretaste of hell in this life. And so fear comes upon all of humanity. And it's a fear that man cannot overcome. It's a supernatural fear, right? Which literally paralyzes man. So we see a little bit of that, like at a funeral. Uh, If you would go to a funeral, you're at the cemetery. Everybody's standing around the the casket. And and they're playing their last, last respects. And all of a sudden... Imagine you're there and the dead man rises. Most people are going to flee running. And they're not afraid of the dead man. They're afraid of what it implies, what it implies for them. They're afraid of the supernatural that has now come into the natural. They're afraid of the eschaton. They're afraid of eternity. They're afraid of what it means for their life, that they have to change. Or how about if the devil appeared to you face to face right in front of you? What would you do? Would you be fearful? Would you be terrified? You will faint with fear, he says. This is the essence of the supernatural fear. The whole world will be struck by great fear when everyone sees the two prophets rise and stand on their feet. That's the level of fear that they will see and experience. Those who, of course, do not believe and do not rejoice uh, and and glorify God, all those who are in rebellion. And then in verse 12, we read, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither to the prophets. Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Their enemies, all of these, were gathered from all the world looking upon this, this, this event. They beheld them. Come up and ascend into heaven now. Not just be resurrected, but to ascend into heaven bodily. Bodily ascend into heaven. All of you who are listening to me and are either under the influence of or in the midst of a Protestant uh, sectarian ideology slash theology and reject the bodily ascent of the mother of God into heaven. How and why would you do that? When we see right here in scripture that the two prophets who did not bear the logos in her own flesh, who were, not, who were not totally regenerated and made into a paradise by the presence of God in their body. Their whole body was one at one with God. Their whole the blood was shared. The whole imagine the unity of the mother of God with with the with the life of the world. And yet we cannot accept the holy tradition that says that her body did not remain in the grave. But we can accept that these two who had been slaughtered, prophets, yes, but not bearers of God in their flesh, not birth givers, not Theotoki in their flesh, they have been resurrected and ascended into heaven and to, the, and, and, and to God, right? They're going before all of humanity as as the continued first fruits of the resurrection. But before them was the most holy Theotokos. It's not hard to understand that God would not allow her flesh to see corruption, but would rise it, raise it on the third day, just uh, as as he rises these, raises these three, these two prophets on the third day as well. So it's a Testimony to the truth of the holy tradition with regard to the mother of God. That's how I see it. 
Again, they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, come up hither. And this is the voice of Christ calling to the two martyrs, come up here. This come up hither is the solution to the great drama of our earthly existence. This is the solution. This is the salvation. This is the, 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 the end of history. And yet the poor atheists, the non-believers, the weak, the cowardly, cowardly, all these who refuse to embrace the gospel, they can't imagine that this is the end of history. This is the solution of our life on earth. Heaven as a solution is inconceivable for them. And so they stand in great fear and they behold it and they struggle to accept it. And they heard a great voice again going up and St. Andrew says the ascension of the two prophets is carried out by the royal carriage. And the royal carriage is a cloud. Let's look at this cloud because this is a kind of a Protestant uh, of, uh, you know, depiction here. I couldn't find an icon of the two prophets going into heaven. So excuse, forgive me if that's a little too cartoonish. Uh, but uh, uh, here we have the ascension of our Lord in an icon up into heaven. And the, um, the cloud, what is this cloud? Well, we know from the ascension of our Lord into heaven, and we know from the patristic writings, that this cloud, like we read in Acts 1.9, a cloud took him out of their sight, and while they were gazing into heaven as he went, right? So the clouds are not formed from water droplets. This is not the cloud that we're talking about here in either case. But it has to do with the presence of divine glory. It is the divine energies, the divine glory of God. That is what this cloud is. It's the divine glory. The, the, the chariot of God is the divine glory. Uh, and St. Paul says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then all who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. He's not talking about water droplets. He's talking about the glory and the divine glory at that. So uh, in 11.13, we read, and the same hour was there uh, was there a great earthquake. And the 10th part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. 7,000. That's not a small number. 7,000 were died from this earthquake of just 10th of the city. And the remnant were affrighted and the, gave glory to the God of heaven. It's interesting about this passage here is that we see earthquakes very often in the scripture. We saw earthquakes at the resurrection. Uh, we we see earthquakes very often representing the power and presence of God. And this in this case, this earthquake seems to be limited to, to Jerusalem. And, and uh, uh, even though uh, there's an earthquake which will rock the whole earth, but it seems to be limited to Jerusalem. So this would be most likely, according to St. Andrew, a physical, natural earthquake, a true earthquake, not a metaphorical one, right? Again, this is a real event, a real occasion and uh, uh, an occurrence. Uh, just as an earthquake marked the death and the resurrection of Christ, so too will an earthquake take place with the resurrection of the two prophets. This is why we think that this may be an actual earthquake. There's only one difference. In the case of the earthquake in Jerusalem with the two prophets, one-tenth of the city, as we read, will fall, and one-tenth of the structures will be destroyed. During the time of Christ, nothing was destroyed, but here we have 7,000 people being killed. Uh, so it's not sure if that number is li literal or allegorical, but in any case, there will be those... Some some people killed. And so two things we can interpret here. First, that this is the assurance from heaven that these two prophets are from God and that the Antichrist is an imposter. And second, that the earthquake serves as a punishment for those who did not believe. And perhaps that's the meaning of those who perished in the earthquake because they did not repent. They did not believe. Finally, the second woe is past, it says. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly, 1113. So immediately we enter the third woe that will take place 
with the trumpet blast of the seventh angel. The only difference now is that we are in the 11th chapter, and this plague, which essentially begins now, ends in the 13th chapter. So it's two full chapters of this coming third woe. In the interim, there are important subjects that are central to the Revel book of Revelation. And here we are entering in, brothers and sisters, to the nucleus, to the center of the book of Revelation. We see now, going forward, the appearance of the woman with the child being chased by the dragon. We see the fight of the archangel Michael with the dragon in heaven. We see the heavenly echo of the triumph in heaven. We see the persecution of the woman by the dragon when her child was pulled into heaven and she fled into the desert. And then the appearance of the beast from the sea, which is the Antichrist in chapter 13. So these are the, these are the events that we're gonna be examining going forward, uh, not next Tuesday, because next Tuesday is Holy Week in the Orthodox Church, and we will not have any live streams throughout the whole week. No question and answer next uh, Thursday. No class on Tuesday of next week. We'll begin again in Bright Week, and we'll chant with you then Christ is Risen. So with this and the end of this session, uh, we've come to the end of this session. We're going to be taking a break for, in, for two weeks. We'll see you in two weeks, and we'll pick up uh, in two weeks... With those events, uh, it'll be, if you're following along in the book, it'll be Lesson 40. I just passed it. 47, I think. And Revelation 5, 11, 15 to 19. So uh, if you want to read ahead, Lesson 47, Revelation 15 to 19. And that's the end of our Lesson 8 in Series 3 covering uh, 11, uh, 8 to 15, 14. All right. And with that, we can open it up to questions. And I think we already have a bunch of questions. Let's see. Uh, I'll wait for those to be posted here. Momentarily, we'll go over to Crowdcast until we get uh, some questions here. All right, one question over in Crowdcast. Father Bless, what would you say is the difference between our day-to-day -day lack of trust in God and the cowardice you spoke of in the earlier part of the lesson tonight that gets us thrown into the lake of fire? How can we have more courage? Yes, you've already answered part of it. Read the lives of the saints, yes, of course, and read the scriptures. Uh, so as I said there in that section, um, we need to be constantly checking ourselves, training ourselves. And just like an athlete is constantly uh, going over again and again and again what will happen in the game, preparing himself uh, and going through various theories, moves. If you're in a football team, you've got a whole you know, series of moves that you and plays that you learn by heart. In the same way, spiritually, we want to think of our life as a spiritual contest, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a time of trial, a time of, of, of running the race and engaging. And so... Uh, we want to test ourselves, examine ourselves, look at ourselves, and that's how we're going to refine things. And we're going to be able to catch ourselves and see ourselves, and then we're going to call out to God. And all of it is increased, all of it is refined, all of it is bettered uh, through the grace of God. Uh, so, uh, but the grace of God doesn't come to one who's not mindful, watchful, repenting, and prayerful. Right? That's the keys that open up the grace of God. So you, you yourself will not increase boldness and avoid cow cowardice. But you, in, in your struggle and synergy with the grace of God, will be given the boldness when you plea, pray for it and treat it and treat for it and work for it by working, on the one hand, against the old man, on the other hand, uh, running to the uh, the Christ and and becoming a, a a new creation, so it's a simultaneously it's a it's a um, negative and a positive uh, way of, way of existence, right? So we're at the the one at the same time we're mindful of what we need to reject and what we need to embrace. We're we're turning away and we're turning toward. We're and we're constantly refining that. So that we see ourselves and we say, you know what? Uh, I see in myself that, I don't know, we'll just give one example. In the morning, 
I think a lot of us are guilty of this. I know I am. In the morning, instead uh, of, uh, of of shying away from the prayer corner, the prayer rope, immediately the prostrations and all the rest, I find excuses to go and do X, Y, Z, right? And so I see that in myself. And now here's the question. Am I going to have the courage, boldness, decisiveness, and, and self-denial to say, tomorrow morning, that's not going to happen. And those little victories that are constantly being won, hopefully on a daily basis, are going, and then, then we stick to them, are going to create a new situation. They're going to, they're going to become habits. They're going to become ways of life, ways of thinking. And we're going to live in that victorious new reality. This happens if you're uh, if you're working physically, uh, you know, to overcome limitations with your body. Let's say you're a, an athlete or a weightlifter or whatever it is. This exact same thing on the physical plane is, is experienced by people who are who are engaged in that way. And in intellectual ways, if you're an intellectual, you're seeing similar things happening. If you're going to make progress, you've got to train yourself. And it's the same thing in the spiritual life. The difference is that it ends up being essentially a gift when we do violence against the old man and we constantly systematically, consciously, daily are uh, are being becoming more and more mindful. Uh, and so, it, you know, cowardice is not just, you know, a kind of, uh, doesn't it, it's not just a gift that God, I mean, I'm sorry, boldness. It's not just a gift that God gives us necessarily. We're born with it. You know, some people are bold and others are not. Uh, certainly there are people who are born with more boldness and uh, depending on their, their spiritual inheritance and, and variety of things. But all of us have, have to acquire and work for it. That is, prepare the ground for it to be given to us as a gift. I don't know if that helped. But, uh, being, of course, it uh, goes without saying that if, if we're going to make progress, we're going to be inspired continually to do that uh, by great examples including uh, the, the many lives of the saints. All right, no, another question. Could the rise of anti-Christian law in Israel be a preamble for the conditions under which the witnesses will be publicly put to death? Um, I suppose it could. It's, to me, it still has a ways to go, but that is a, a, very, notable, a very notable event. I mean, so blatantly anti-Christian you got to wonder uh, what did they see? What have they what have they come to in Israel to believe that they can do that, get away with it? Uh, you know, not a few people in the United States who are not uh, Jews are are very instrumental in supporting the state of Israel. Uh, you know, economically, politically. So it's kind of startling to see their openly, brazenly anti-Christian, you know, anti-evangelical. Uh, I guess. That shows also, I think, the success of some of those Christian groups that are that are reaching out to Jews. I don't know if you've paid attention. What is it? The, Israel is one or one is Israel or something like that. It's a group of former Jew, Jews who've become Christian. I mean, former pra, pra, uh, practicing Jews who converted to Christ, embraced him as their Messiah, uh, and now as Christians, Jews, but who are followers of Christ. Now they're turning to their fellow Israelites and saying he is the Messiah. So I think there's a lot of activity there that they're probably pushing back against. They must have had some success. Uh, so it's hard to say if this is going to be something that's going to last. But the fact that they've they felt the boldness to be able to try to do that, I think, is significant. Uh, but we'll have to just wait and see if it's going to actually be a forerunner, as you say, to that Uh you know, totalitarian state where they they're slaughtering people in uh, in the uh, square as they did the prophets. Okay, one for Israel. Yes, all right. I don't see any other questions. That's going to be a short question answer session tonight. Uh, okay, I see this one here. Should I stay away from my mother-in-law? She mocks me and is rude, or should I bear it? I stay silent, but I get angry inside. Okay, thank you for that, Stephanie. Stephanie. 
your mother-in-law, your your husband's mother, is not an insignificant person in your life. Uh, somebody who mocks and, and is rude to you is 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 troublesome and difficult. And if you end up reacting and falling again and again into some kind of uh, sinful uh, reaction, then you may you may need to uh, take measures so that you're not in that position. On the other hand, having someone mock or be rude to you is a wonderful opportunity for ascetic struggle and to show great love and patience. That would be, if you can do it, that's the question, that would be beneficial for her to see somebody who's long-suffering and loving and humble, and it would be beneficial probably for your husband, who certainly would like her, her, his wife to not reject out of hand entirely his mother, most likely. I'm assuming that's the case. Maybe not. So you have to think about it in that, that, that context. What am I doing in this context to draw closer to Christ? Are there opportunities here? Are there opportunities to love? How can I help this person? But that's going to depend on your spiritual struggle and your spiritual state. And depending on where you're at, a spiritual father might say to you, better to stay away and pray. Or here's your opportunity to learn humility, long-suffering, and love, and to just, uh, you know, endure. So I don't know. Either one could be possible, but it really depends on you and your spiritual state and your and what what happens when you're with her. Um, so I don't think there's one answer. Depends on you and the and your uh, and your uh, husband and and your 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 stance on the whole thing. I don't know. Uh, I'm seeing the a lot of the questions, John, right into the in the comments section. So if I can just go ahead probably and take those directly from there. You probably if that's it's not a problem. You can keep posting them there just to make sure we, we get them all. But uh, Father Bless, I follow and attend a new calendar parish, but I do confession at an old calendar monastery. Do you see any potential issues by of, by me being influenced by both sides of our faith? Uh, when you say old calendar monastery, do you mean old calendarist? In other words, it's not in communion with the local churches because that's not the same thing as a monastery on the old calendar. So in, in the event that you're talking about a monastery which is not in communion to local churches that's a problem and it's a problem that i've talked about many times uh their stance is not the problem in terms of ecumenism if you're talking about an old calendarist monastery which means by that i just simply mean they don't have communion with the local churches and they've taken that stance um if you're talking about that uh i've said many times that this ecclesiological stance i don't find to be the patristic stance I'm generalizing, but I think that's, you know, almost always applicable um, in, in in this day and age, right? This is a this is a, a movement and a reality that's changed for the over the last hundred years. It's not a constant reality; it's changing. And today, from what I know, unfortunately, an increasing number of hierarchs, at least in Greece, are embracing a very problematic and unorthodox ecclesiology. An ecclesiology which sees the old calendars movement as the only uh, uh, church, the, only, the church, and all the local churches, even though there's never been a council to condemn them, and many of the people in the local churches are fighting against heresy of ecumenism, they've come to the conclusion that they're all no longer gr with grace, and therefore those who come from the old calendars, church, the uh, local churches to the old calendars, need to be at least chrismated, if not baptized. So... There's, of course, some variety among that, but it, from what I'm told, that's where most of the hierarchy is going and has gone, and most of the thinking is going. Now, there's a minority that does not believe that. But the problem is that this, that the fact that they've arrived, that a good portion of them have arrived, that is not an accident. It's, it's, it has to do with whether or not their methodology was that of the fathers and chosen and, and, and done by church fathers. Now, to make a distinction, ceasing commemoration according to Canon 50 
uh, 15 of the first second council and all the all the, the re relevant patristic material is not the same as what the old calendars have done and and, and their ecclesiological conclusions i think is proof of that right so ceasing commemoration of a particular bishop who is teaching heresy is protected and and enshrined in the canonical literature that is all it means though it doesn't mean starting a new jurisdiction doesn't mean that everyone who doesn't cease commemoration is a heretic. It doesn't mean that all the bishops that are in communion with that particular bishop are heretics because they don't break with him. I mean, there's all these conclusions people come to which are baseless. They don't actually have strong support in the canons and in the church fathers. Before a general council which de deals with and lays down the boundaries on the particular heresy that's erupted, there's a lot of chaos. You can see that clearly in church history. Even after the first council, you have a three three major saints and three major examples which disprove the old calendarist ecclesiology. And that is St. Miletius of Antioch, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, and St. Ambrose of Milan. To greater or lesser degrees, they all witnessed to the reality that the church was not doing what the old calendars have done. They were not so rigid and so decided they were working in the midst of Arians even after the first ecumenical council in part these saints were elected by Arians and so that means they were somehow in the same churches same community same they were somehow they were in communion they maybe not maybe there was some strange arrangements it's not really clear in church history but they didn't do what the old calendars have done that's for sure and there were those who accused them of being lax. I mean, St. Miletius, who was the spiritual father of St. John Chrysostom, who ordained St. Basil the Great, he was accused of being lax, of being in community, allowing uh, the, recognizing essentially the Arians as a part of the church uh, in his diocese. So anyway, I can't get into all the church history. It's very interesting. But the point I want to make is that if you're talking about an old calendar jurisdiction, I think that's a problem. I think there's schizophrenia there. You can't do both. They don't want you to do both anyway, usually. So I'm confused why they would be encouraging you to go back and forth to a parish. I'm not sure how that works. You need to be clear. What is, are you following the patristic methodology and you're resisting heresy, but according to the fathers, or are you going to break off from all the other Orthodox? I have communion with any of the Orthodox, including those fighting heresy. That's what the old colonists have done. They don't work with the other Orthodox. We're not all one together. Uh, and, it, you know, there's, anyway, I've talked about this many times. We're not going to go any further, but that that would be my short answer. And you can go to our videos and find longer answers to that whole um, question there. Do we have two options, uh, image of Christ or the opposing image of the beast or are one? Are we one or the other? No middle ground? The image of the beast is the Antichrist, the image of God. So you, you do you have a middle ground between God and the Antichrist, Christ and the Antichrist? Do you have a middle ground between the grace of God and spiritual enslavement to the passions? Is there some what what is there? Where is this middle ground that you're wondering about it? Uh, lukewarm, I spit you out of my mouth. There's no neutrality in the spiritual life. You're either going forward or backward. There's no like, oh, I'm just going to hang out in this, this neutral zone. I'm not really a Christian, not really an atheist. I'm not really a believer. I'm not really an unbeliever. Is that, that doesn't exist. You might think it exists. You might want it to exist, but it doesn't exist. You're either working for your salvation, working and cooperating with the grace of God, or you're not. You're on the way out. You're on, you're going backward, right? Ultimately, that's the conclusion. Now, you might it might seem like you're just cruising along and there's no real friction one way or the other, but that's just what it seems like. That's not what it is in reality. And and you know, neutrality is actually not being in the grace of God. Right? If you're gonna, if you're like, I'm actively trying to just find that middle ground where I can kind of have be servants of and have two masters. Uh, but lukewarm is spit out of the mouth of the Lord. No, that's not, that's not a path. That's not a reality. You've got to be working toward 
the fulfillment and the cleansing and the re reestablishment of the of the image of God in you, and then the coming to likeness, going from image to likeness. That's what happens in the church. In the church, you you are given the gift of the restoration of the image in baptism. And the grace of God is given to you, and the kingdom of God is given to you. Everything is given as a gift. And then that has to be assimilated and embraced, and that process then is called basically acquiring the likeness. And that that, that demands our cooperation, demands our uh, synergy, our cooperation, and that's a process. So uh, that process it means that we're working at it. Like, it's work. Uh, it's not just, you know, some kind of automated salvation, which is what it seems like a lot of Protestant evangelicals have. Like once saved, always saved. I'm, I'm, I'm guaranteed entry. Uh, I got the ticket. You know, I've arrived. That is delusional, right? It's delusional because it doesn't understand. It doesn't understand the fall. It doesn't understand the restoration. What's going on here? It doesn't understand our part, the, uh, the part of the disposition of man how he has to assimilate it. It doesn't understand the subjective salvation. It takes the objective salvation and makes it just an automatic button for everybody. But there has to be the subjective part. There has to be our personal salvation has to be worked out after we're given the salvation in Christ, right? All men will be right, raised in the last day. Everyone will come out of the graves. There will be those who are resurrected unto life, life eternal, and those unto judgment. It's Christ, crisis, right? Separation. That's what that means. So uh, what we do with every moment of our life, every breath that we breathe will determine. It's, it's our yes in every moment and every breath is our yes or no to God. Our yes like the mother of God, right? We're saying yes with the way we live, the way we think, the way we pray. Or we're saying no. And so therefore we're either going forward or we're going backwards, ultimately. Father, here's if all people will be resurrected, then why does the church teach no to cremation? Should it matter really? Well, that image and that body that is sacred, that's now especially those who've been baptized, chrismated, and communed, we show the utmost respect and love for. And we don't intentionally desecrate it and destroy it. We put it in the grave like a seed that will bring forth fruit. And there's all this symbolism and, the, and, and all this meaning in the funeral service. We've never cremated in the history of the church. We've never embraced that as, as something that is consistent with and, and, and uh, um, an extension of our relationship with God. We don't see that. God does not intentionally destroy his creation and, and incinerate it. I mean, it's just, it, it, there's so many problems with it. Spiritually speaking, like it doesn't even it doesn't even come out of a Christian soul to think that that's what we would do to the body. We have such care for the body in the funeral service. We 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 anoint it with oil, right? We we bury it with respect. Uh, we 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 after three years in Greece, we dig it up. We take the bones, we wash them, we put them in an ossuary, and and and, and then many times we discover uh, that these relics are holy or or they're or they're incorrupt. And we and then we have them and we venerate them in the Orthodox Church. Can you imagine if we all cremated for 2,000 years, we cremated all the bodies? We wouldn't have all these incorrupt bodies. We wouldn't have St. John of Shanghai and St. Spiridon and all the, We wouldn't have any of that if we cremated the bodies. Like It's so foreign to our understanding, our, our relationship with the flesh, with the blood, body of human beings. It doesn't even occur to... Only the enemies of Christ did that destroyed the bodies, burned the bodies, right? So the, the what, your question, Helen, is extremely legalistic and rationalistic. Like, who cares? If we're all going to rise, it doesn't matter. No, 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 that's, that's not how it is. That's not how it is. We, we, would never, we would never intentionally bring about any of that. We would never want to lose the relics uh, that God would use. That's all been, the body of the Christian has been sanctified. Would you take anything that's sanctified and intentionally destroy it and turn it into ashes? Would you take, I mean, we we dispose of some holy things in this way. If we have to, we bury them or we burn them and bury them because we don't want anything else to uh, 
you know, to happen to them, to be treated with disrespect or to throw in the garbage, that's a different question. Everything is, 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 a, is an extension of our respect for God and our respect for the image of God, which is man, right? So that's, uh, that's where we're coming from. And uh, it's a tragedy, tragedy that the, the various heterodox have embraced cremation. Even 30 years ago, I remember the, the Catholicism was, was resisting it, if I remember correctly, or maybe maybe longer, I don't know. And now they're doing it, and they're doing it all in play. I mean, it's really a tragedy. Uh, and it's another sign of their departure from the Christian tradition, which is a, which is a challenge. Um, okay, so going back to the question of the old calendar, according to the person who asked it, it's established by Elder Ephrem. I don't know of any monastery on the old calendar established by Elder Ephrem except in Greece. So are you in Greece? Then, if that's the case, then there's not an issue. If it's a, it's a, it's in the question is where is it in communion with the other churches, the Orthodox, or is it not? That's the question. So I think you you've got your answer on that. Hopefully, your blessings, Father. Do you think that the royal on the royal path we can be a bit more left or right because of our disposition, but still be on the royal path? Um. I don't. Th I don't think our disposition. Uh, you know, you maybe you want to say your character is that what you want to say? Our disposition is not going to play that role, but maybe people's character and their and their you know, um, their personality is going to defect, affect whether they're on the royal path. The royal path is the narrow way of the of salvation. It's 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 and it's always in Christ and therefore it's always balanced and not falling into extre extremes and going off of the narrow path. Uh, so it doesn't have to do with. Yeah, I don't see the disposition affecting that. I mean, we all need to acquire the mind of Christ and discernment. So if you're saying, well, some some people's disposition is really fervent and they go to the right more. And others is not so much. And they go to the left. Both of them probably should self-correct and you know and 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 come to the royal path if they're going off a bit to the right or the left. That's probably what I would say. They need to they need to kind of work on 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 tempering and maturing and 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 forming sobriety and all these things. Like that's a sign of spiritual growth. So I'm not really sure what you mean, but those are some of the thoughts that come to mind. The other one plays a lot of tricks. Bless, bless, Father. The other one plays a lot of tricks and some very tricky ones that can. The other one, he means the enemy. Okay, he plays tricks. How how will we know not to fall in his traps? Um, that's learned through obedience humility, spiritual struggle. It's just like anything else. How will you learn um, how to, you know, play the piano? Or how will you learn how to walk through a minefield? You know, how, how will you learn anything? It's by experience, by trial and error, by obedience. You learn under someone else, right? Uh, so it's it. the traps of the enemy come uh, to the and people who fall into them come because they have they have pride, arrogance. They trust themselves too much. Uh, they aren't seriously applying the commandments and struggling to f fulfill the commandments. They leave themselves open through the various passions, and they ultimately decide to follow and to fall into the trap. Now, the traps are set, but he can't do anything but set traps and. And invite us and maybe try to push us, but he can't force us into his traps, right? So we walk into those traps because we're not paying attention, we're be, we're negligent, we're proud, we're arrogant. There's always something that we're giving rights to the enemy, and then we're falling into his traps, right? We're somehow involved by acquiescing to the passions and to the, the demonic uh, suggestions. 
So the way you don't fall into those traps is that you're extremely humble. You're extremely obedient in, in, to God and then to your spiritual father in, in, in the spiritual life. You're extremely careful uh, to struggle to keep the commandments. You don't stand with you know, flippant and arrogant and I don't need this and I don't care and it doesn't matter. And I'm going to go out on Saturday night until two in the morning and still go to church in the morning. No, that's not a serious, for you will fall into traps. So that's that's extreme humility. In one word, humility is the is the answer to your question. Father bless. It's my understanding that you had a desire for monasticism when you were young, but later found God was calling you to the marriage. Is this true? And if so, could you share with us your experience? I don't really talk too much about these things, but uh, I mean on on internet anyway. Uh, but maybe we can get something good for people. Um, I, I did. I did go to Mount Athos. Uh, set out to go to Mount Athos in 1996, where I spent several months, and went back in 1998 after spending about a year in the monastery of Saint John of Shanghai in San Francisco. In at that point, Point Reyes in 1995, 1996-7. But then I went back to Athos because I just couldn't couldn't uh, think of much else besides going back to Athos at that point. So I went back to Athos, eventually found my spiritual father, an elder in Mount Athos, by God's providence. It's very obvious that he should be my spiritual father. I'd been searching for years. And then he said, well, let's, um, let's, let's discern now together what God's will is. I said, I, I want to be in the church. I think I want to be a monk, but... I just want to be in the church. I don't want to do anything else. So I was open to the priesthood, but I thought I really wanted to be a monk first and foremost. And uh, so I spent a year going off into Mount Athos. I was living at Thessaloniki, learning Greek at the university. And I would go very often, like every weekend and all the feasts and Pascha and Christmas and everything. So th then the summer team, summertime came and my spiritual father sat me down and said, um, uh, okay, so I think you need a, a co-struggler. And I said, what does that mean? I mean, am I, I going to go to like a Kali and like it'd be just two of us? Or am I going to go, what is it? What are you talking about? And he said, no, 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 you need, you need to be a priest and you need to get married and, and go to theological school. And, and I, and I reacted to that. I didn't really want, I didn't think I was, we had, I didn't think we had discerned it yet, <laughs> at least on my end. And uh, I really wanted to be a, be a monastic. I had kind of promised my my love beloved saints that I would do this. So it came as a kind of a shock. And and I went back to my I went back to my keli at the monastery. And I was praying fervently to Saint John of Shanghai, San Francisco, who was kind of my adopted uh, patron saint. And uh, and then I was reading the life and the teachings of Elder Joseph the Hesychist at the time. And even though I was traveling in my mind throughout the whole of the monastic, you know, politia, the whole, the whole, all the monasteries I'd ever visited and thinking, well, where could I go to be a monk if, if I can't be a monk here at this monastery with my spiritual father, which was crazy, crazy thoughts. I read this passage in the, in the life of St. Joseph the Hesychus, who said, when he says, um, the, monk that does not accept the first word out of his elder's mouth even if he travels the whole world he will not find peace that's how i remember the passage and the truth was that i have i, I was traveling the whole world in my mind trying to figure out where i could go to be a monk and i realized that i needed to be obedient and i had to had to be obedient to my discerning spiritual father so I went back and I said, okay, what, what am I supposed to do? And he said, stay here for the summer and then um, go back uh, to theological school, start theological school in the fall. So I begrudgingly accepted that, even though the whole summer was faint, was off and on torturous, thinking that I was had to leave. After the feast, uh, the great feast of the Holy Cross. I uh, was about a week away from the beginning of the theological school's uh, semester, so I departed. And 
and I went to the and then the following Monday, I went to theological school, showed up, and uh, and there was no class because nothing starts on time in Greece. And so I I went to the church nearby, and by God's providence, at the supplication service of the Mother of God was my future presbytera. And within to make a long story short, within a few weeks, we were uh, basically uh, the elder came out and blessed us to get married. So it was it was almost immediate. And it was uh, uh, later on, the elder told me that that was in large part that was because you were obedient and God had had uh, had all arranged. Of course, God has everything arranged for us long before we get there. And so uh, I accepted that. I mean, it was a sign that this was God's will for me. I think that's another reason why God allowed it, that it, it was so immediate. I was, you know, a week outside the monastery and immediate, and uh, I had found the presbytera. So th things things really went uh, very quickly. We were, um, you know, we were married, and I was ordained within a couple of years, and the rest is history. So hopefully that... Hopefully the lesson that you learned there, because what's the point of me telling you this, except that we force ourselves sometimes to be obedient. We force ourselves to accept God's will, even when we don't want it. And God can work with us at that point. And we can actually start to walk the path that he had has set out for us. And we have to accept it, even when it's totally counterintuitive, like, why would an why would an elder not want a young man who wants to be a monk to be a monk? Well, he has he had the discernment to say that this was best for you. This is what you need. Your soul needs this, you know. And it's very hard to discern that sometimes, you know. So we have to trust God and His providence and His spiritual guides. And and when we do that, then things start to start to roll. And we don't have to we don't have to plan it all. We don't have to try to figure. It out. I've said many times. In the past, about the question of finding a bride, you don't you don't go looking for a bride. You go look to do the will of God and to do and to, and to enter His kingdom, to seek His kingdom first, and all else shall be added unto you. And if you do that, and you do it with zeal and 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 humility, I I, I believe. I mean, the, not just because of my experience, but because of what the gospel teaches and the saints show us in so many ways. It, the doors will be open to you and you'll make progress. So hopefully that's hopefully that's helpful for you all on your uh, your journey of discerning the will of God for you. What do we do to fulfill our calling as children of God? And what do I do if all my life I am forgotten, abused, and hated without cause? Thank you. God bless you. Our fulfillment, the fulfilling of our children of our calling as children of God is to be grafted into his uh, his vine, to become his members, to be immersed into his life, and that all happens in the body of Christ. And then to through the keeping of the commandments and through drawing near through prayer and fasting be conformed to his image and then eventually arrive at his likeness. That's our calling as children of God. Everything else is secondary and tertiary and circumstantial. That's the purpose. Everything else, becoming this, that, or the other thing, becoming a priest or not becoming a priest, becoming a teacher or not becoming a teacher, doesn't matter if that doesn't first take precedence. As far as the abuse that you've suffered in this world, you can take courage that all who seek to live righteously in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution in this life. And everything that's received in humility and without complaint is a great reward, uh, is a great reward is prepared for each one of us. If we suffer, if we're abused, if we're rejected, we resemble the one who suffered and was abused and was rejected, the, our Lord who was crucified for us. And if we can embrace that and willingly not complain, then we have a great reward already prepared for us. But in Christ and for Christ, this has to happen. 
for his sake, we suffer and we are patient. And in his grace and according to his way, we struggle to do this in all humility and patience. And if you understand that this life is vain, it's passing, it's short, and that everything you're suffering is just a blink of an eye before eternity. And if you would remember the witness of St. Ephemia, Ephemia, rather, uh, who appeared to St. Paisius and said to him, if I knew what was prepared for those who suffered for Christ, I would wish that my martyrdom was much worse 10 times and that the reward would be 10 times as great. So we don't understand, most of us, what's truly beneficial and good for us. We don't understand because we don't, we have not entered into this, the, the logic of the gospel, which is turns our logic on its head. We see things external, we see things, and we, we, we judge according to the judgment of the world many, many times. And therefore, we are disappointed with this life. And we will always be disappointed with this life because that's how, it, that's the way things are in this life. If we seek fame, fortune, goodness, money, whatever it is, that's vain and passing, and that's the aim of our life, we will be disappointed always. If we understand that this is passing and that everything is for a purpose and it's for our purification and our illumination and our glorification, and we accept it joyfully, then we can transform it all into eternal uh, uh, benefits, eternal re rewards. And that's a, that's a great and wonderful thing. So don't look for externals. Look for in those trials and tribulations, am I going, am I walking with Christ? Am I going deeper? Am I suffering without complaining? Am I rejoicing that the, that I've been made worthy to, to suffer in this life? And, and put all your hope in Christ, that he sees everything. He sees every last abuse, every last rejection, every last, uh, you know, bad word. All of it is seen by God. And, and there's an angel, as it were, writing it all down. And when we when we suffer it and we don't complain, that those things are all going to be to the shame of the demons, going to be the rejection of the demonic claims on our soul, right? It's going to be likeness with the long-suffering Lord, uh, the crucified one. Holy Protection Monastery in Pennsylvania established by Elder Ephraim. That's not on the old calendar, uh, Mr. Greek 79. That's actually not on the old calendar. So I'm not really sure why you think that's on, that was not on the old calendar. I've been there many times. Uh, okay, Marios. Can a man still get a priest when he had sexual sins in the past but repented and found came back to Orthodoxy? I think what you mean to say can you be ordained to the priesthood if you've fallen into fornication? No, if it happened after your baptism. If this is something that happens before you're baptized, before you receive into the Orthodox Church, yes, baptism washes away all sin. But afterwards, after we were baptized, chrismated, communed, if we fall into fornication, adultery, uh, actually sodomy, and according to some, even other unnatural acts, then that disqualifies us for the priesthood because the priesthood is so exalted and so exceptional. And the one who is going to go into that battle, that warfare has to be in a certain state and not have given rights to the enemy. Now there are, there are bishops today who have done, who have given economy on this question. In other words, they've allowed that which is normally not allowed. And I cannot comment on that. That's their call, their responsibility. Uh, and I, you know, that's, that's what the, that's, that's what a bishop does. He's responsible for that. I can't make a call on that, but I, I can tell you that that's not the norm. That's not what the canons say. It's not what the church fathers say. Uh, and it is, it is wrought with difficulties, uh, but they're, you know, ultimately that's their call. And I, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, in each case, it, it needs much prayer and discernment. Uh, but normally, canonically, no. If you have been baptized and then fallen into these sins, you should not 
seek the priesthood. Uh, if it's before baptism, you can seek the priesthood if you have a blessing from your spiritual father. In the priesthood in the Orthodox Church, the spiritual father has to sign off on it. And the wife, the presbytera, has to agree. Both of them have to agree for the priest to be ordained, for the man to be ordained to the priesthood. And, of course, the bishop has to agree. So three people have to give their blessing for each priest that's ordained in the Orthodox Church. Uh, I'm going to go to the private chat because it seems like there's a lot more comments here, and I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm missing some of the questions. So let's go back to all these questions here. Uh, let me try to get up to where I was. Oh, there's a lot of questions. What are we to make of the Greek old calendars such as Petros Astifides of Astoria, who were consecrated by Rogue Court? St. John Maximus seemed to have supported them too. Well, they, they have the support of Rokor, so Rokor was always in communion. So I guess there's gray areas everywhere, isn't there? But the, does, does that exist anymore? No. Nope. So today it doesn't really help us much. I don't know what to make of it either today. What does that mean for today? I don't know. There's no real canonical, synodical decision on that. It's kind of a big gray area. Uh, but again, I'm not so much focusing on the technicalities or whether they had communion or whether I'm talking about the methodology they've chosen. So even if you were to say, okay, yeah, they're all, in, we're all in, ultimately we're all in communion or, or, or this group is in communion or this bishop is in communion. I would say, yes, but are they following the Holy Fathers? Are what they're doing, is it what the fathers did? Is, is their methodology of resisting heresy what the fathers did? That's all, that's really what matters to me. And if I was convinced that they were actually following the Holy Fathers, I could care less, much less about the canonical legal legalities of it all. Right? That's secondary, but it's not unrelated. It's a fruit of, I think, a departure from the uh, from the patristic methodology of fighting heresy. And I've said this many times. I don't, I don't like repeating things because a lot of you have heard it all, and so I'm wasting your time. But you know, most. Almost most, if not nearly all of the old calendarist jurisdictions and those who are witnessing from those places, their witness is not really effective, not really heard. It's really irrelevant to the great struggle that the church is going through because of their stance. In other words, I think a fruit that shows the problem of their stance is, is this like if, if they the fathers were never irrelevant they were part of the struggle they were close to the they were close to the people they were beloved of the people they didn't they didn't walk away from the other orthodox who were struggling essentially unfortunately the old calendars walked away from and many of them reject as I said earlier in their ecclesiology other orthodox who have not ceased communion with the various teachers of heresy they've rejected these Elders, Elder Ephraim, Elder, you know, uh, saints of the church, Paisius, Porphyrius, they've rejected these saints, they've rejected these elders, they don't consider them witnesses and saints, and so it's very problematic to me. That doesn't, it, that does not jive with the history of the church and with the witness of the fathers, it doesn't, it does not ultimately help the, the, the overcoming of the heresy, so th that's the essential question. I would love to be able to, 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 uh, you know, have an open discussion with those who, in, who could show me maybe if I was wrong somewhere or, or why that's that's not correct. I would, I would welcome that. But I've and I've done that in, on occasion in the past. I've met with people and I have not seen I've not seen the case made to, that, that they're really following the patristic methodology. And I've read quite a bit on it. Anyway, I don't like to get back again and again. This topic is we got many things to talk about. What do we do to fulfill our calling as children of God? Okay, I already did that. Um, Father had a meeting with a priest at one year ago and got a catechesis book, but he stopped answering my emails. I regularly I attended regularly, but have not had any contact and don't really know what to do. Well, um, did you go back to the parish and attend the services? I would just go to the services. And if not that parish, another parish. That's that's what I would do. I don't 
there's a practical problem. You've got to solve the practical issue. Now, if this priest is just not being cooperative and doing his job as a pastor and a catechist, then I guess you got to go to another priest. And if there's no other priest in the area, then maybe you have to travel. I don't know what else to say. These are practical issues. Find a solution. And, and by going either to this priest or another priest, this parish, another parish, but don't let this obstacle stop you from making progress. Um, even if it means you're only going once a month to a parish, it's okay. God sees all these things. Do what you can and keep going. I don't know. Maybe I'm, if I don't, I'm sorry if I didn't answer that properly. I don't know what else to say. How should we at, react to people blaspheming God in front of us? You should rebuke it, call it out, and then if there's no repentance, depart from that person, at least temporarily. If they're, a, if they're, if they're in your household, you can't depart permanently. Depart immediately at, at that moment. But you, in no way should we sit, stand by idly, passively in front of blasphemers uh, and, and those who are taking and, and speaking ill of, of, of Christ the Holy Trinity, the Most Holy Theotokos, the saints. That me silence in front of that is a kind of acquiescence and agreement, and therefore you're participating in the sin. And I think that's not what you want to do. You should speak against it. You should say, friend, don't speak ill of God and the Mother of God. And if you do continue to speak ill and sin in this way, I, I will depart from you or please depart from me. You can say it meekly and simply. You don't have to scream or yell, God forbid, but you need to say it decisively. And then you need to take decisive action. Pray and pray hard that you can that you can say it with love, but also with decisiveness. And you can withstand it because there's going to be a temptation, right? He's going to probably come back at you, whatever. You need to withstand it. So you got to pray at the same time. Father blessed, could you touch on righteous warfare in regards to what we are seeing today and perhaps battles of the past? How it relates to our daily spiritual struggle. Well, what do you mean righteous warfare? You mean physical warfare? Because you say in regards to what we're seeing today. I'm not really sure what you mean. It's a pretty general question. Righteous warfare today and in the past, how it relates to our daily spiritual struggle. Do you want to unpack... And ask me again below here um, what you mean exactly. Are you talking about spiritual warfare? And what do you mean battles of the past? Are you talking about heresy? What do you mean? That's a little vague to me. Yuanis asks, I guess this is an add-on to my question. Would these, who's Yuanis? I guess this is the Greek. I don't know. Would these old calendars be considered to still have grace according to us if they were consecrated by a canonical jurisdiction? Who's your bishop? What does he say? What is the, if you're in the church abroad, what do they say? Are they in communion with them? It's pretty straightforward. You don't have to figure out their history and their canon canonicity. You need to be a part of the, the local church, wherever it is, and, and, and work out your salvation under that priest or bishop. Uh, and if they are in communion with that group, then you can be in communion with them. If they're not, then you're not, and you don't go. You're not in communion with them. You don't go and participate. If there's going to be a council and they're going to be examined, that's in the future, and the, it'll be in the hands of the bishops at that council to determine the status of, you know, with relation to the church of these kind of gray area jurisdictions that were a part of World Corps but now aren't and. They were, were, you know, what what is their status? I think that ultimately, probably an ecumenical council would have to determine it ultimately. But you and I are not going to figure it much out in, in ultimately in that in that situation. But we're not in communion with them. I mean, they've ceased to be in communion with Road Corps twenty years ago. They the ones that were in communion with Road Corps departed long before they were united to Moscow. And so, I don't think today there's a lot of gray area. Maybe once upon a time there was, but there's not now. So, but you don't you don't you don't have to come to a grand conclusion. Graceless, not graceless. You just need to be in communion with the church. And on a practical level, there's not a lot of a lot of questions to be answered, right? It's more theoretical. Like, what do I what should I consider them to be? I think that's that's a decision that only the church in council and the bishops ultimately in council can figure out ultimately.
right? If there's any gray area, if there's any, you know, confusion. I know we look forward to the kingdom of, to come, but what of Byzantium and other great Christian empires? Why is it wrong to struggle towards that? Were you here for last night's lecture? Last night's lecture, we had a couple slides in which we talked about the trap of seeking to acquire political power to resist the spirit of Antichrist and the rise of Antichrist. So that's a trap. And there's several things that we're undoing in terms of the gospel. One is that in this life we're going to have tribulation and crucifixion. And that approach is essentially undermining uh, clear promises that the Lord gave us as, as to how our how we will relate to this world. So, um, and then I would remind you that the the fourth century uh, developments with Saint Constantine the Great and Saint Theodosius did not come about because the the rank and file, the priests, the monks, the bishops were actively seeking a political solution. They were persecuted pretty much up to the day Constantine saw the cross in the sky. It was all God's doing that there was a, you know, a, a, a symphonia of state and church. It was God's doing through Constantine and, and, and the other emperors. There was not a, a, a movement, a political movement among Christians to establish a Christian empire, right? That really was not happening. It was a, a total surprise in many ways. The church understood their place in this world as the leaven, as the the, the witness to the eschaton uh, that we would be carrying cross and we'd be persecuted. You will be persecuted if you want to live righteously. You will be persecuted if you follow Christ. Uh, blessed are you who are persecuted, all the rest, right? So, so the idea that we're going to work at this stage in history we are going to bring about a reversal through our activity, I think is misguided, to say the least. We don't know what, what, what age we're living in and what's going on, the signs of the times. Uh, so it's not like you're bad, it's a bad desire to see that come about, but the, myth, the way it came about once upon a time and the way it may come about again is going to be through God's providence and God's intervention and not through some kind of political movement. Father, I drink a bottle of wine about once a week. I get strongly merry, but not drunk. Hmm. I know the Bible says no to drunkenness, but perhaps that means something more severe. Am I okay? Uh, Helen, you know, I can't really judge whether you're beyond the border there. You know, in your conscience, you say you become strongly merry. Uh, you know, it's going to depend on your ascetic struggle and your conscience, because Others will say, I don't want to lose even this much of control of my senses, my mind, my heart, watchfulness, prayerfulness over my person. And therefore, I'm not going to even touch wine. I mean, it depends. Like, There's people who never touched wine in their life. They were ascetics. There's, there's a whole spectrum of ascetic struggle, right? So... I can't tell you you passed the line or not. Your conscience has to speak to you along with your spiritual father. And you have to decide, you know, how strong and how much you want to struggle against the passions. And and if you are opening yourself up to some passion and you're a little concerned, it sounds like, that maybe you're falling into that passion, that's probably a sign you need to dial it back. Probably a sign you need to dial it back. But I don't know. I'm not there for you to really determine that. Father Peter, what advice do you have for someone who has a mental illness but really wants to pursue monasticism? Uh, I would pursue monasticism. I don't even know what that means anymore. Do you know how many people have mental illnesses today? This life produces mental illness. You need to go and have a spiritual father who will take you in. That's the that's the big decision that needs to be made by a spiritual father. So... Pursue it, but be totally open that maybe it's not for you. Just like I told you earlier, my story. 
you have to be open that the aim is not to become one thing or another. The aim is to be united to Christ. And if you can do that in a monastic setting somewhere and really do it under salvation and not get into traps, because monasteries, just like anywhere else, you can fall into traps. There are monasteries that are not healthy. There are there are things going on in monasteries that just like in marriages, right? This is not some I'm not hopefully hopefully I'm not telling you telling you things you don't know. It's just human nature, right? If you're not struggling, it doesn't matter if you're in a monastery or not. If you're not praying, you're not fasting, you're not you're not being obedient, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't magically make you holy because you're in a holy place or in a holy city or in a holy monastery. It, it, your struggle is in your hands, right? So, in any case, I don't think mental illness per se is an obstacle, but you need to go to a monastery. It, this is monastic life is not an idea. It's incarnate in a elder in a monastery with brothers. Can you live with these particular people and humble yourself and serve them? That's the question. Mental illness or not, and I don't know what mental illness you have. I don't know what degree you have. So, all of that is very theoretical. But I would say. Again, per se, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't become a monk. It depends. It all depends on a lot of other factors. Father, bless. What is a good prayer for a priest that is caught up in ecumenism? Is there some particular prayer that we need? Or, but they need to come to repentance. I mean, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on Father so-and-so. How can I rephrase my prayer in my mind to help and not judge? The way we avoid judging is we put ourselves in the position of the one we're prone to judge. And we consider their position. And we say things like this. Well, Father so-and-so, he didn't have the benefit of going to, I don't know, theological school that or going to a right theological, or he didn't have been of going to meeting a great elder, or he didn't, he's involved in this jurisdiction with the, you know, and we start putting ourselves in his position, not to justify his actions, but to have sympathy for his position and his person, and then to pray fervently as if for him, on behalf of him, in his stead, that he might find that which he is lacking illumination, repentance, contrition, and therefore make a turn away from the traps and the delusion that he may be falling into. So you've got to, to really pray. You've got to have broken heart and pain of heart for your neighbor, your brother, your sister, and you've got to stand in pain uh, before God, and then your prayer will be uh, beneficial. Uh, as long as you see him uh, only as as impersonally and not you haven't put yourself in his position and you're saying basically he's doing xyz and you're identifying the sin and the sinner well you're not going to have compassion for him. and you know you're not going to help him get out of that delusion believe me it's hard because we see how the church is getting really manhandled by by leaders who are engulfed in this delusion of, of ecumenism. And it's very hard to be compassionate and sympathetic to those who are on a daily basis taking the church further away from unity and holiness, which is you know marks of the church. When you have schisms that are created and doubled down on and made worse by these same leaders, you have to it's difficult to put yourself in their position and say they and, and pray for them fervently, but that's that's the struggle. That's the struggle, right? Never to identify the sin in the sinner and never to relativize and dismiss the sin as if it doesn't matter, because then we're doing damage to the sinner as well, right? We're not going to help the sinner at all in that way. That's what the world wants to do. The world wants to say, here's how you solve this problem. No more sin. There he is. Hey, now we're all good. That's not how it works, does it? It's not possible. It's delusional. That's what they want to do. Humanism wants it. No, no, there's no love. Love covers everything. No. And uh, it goes from bad to worse. Good evening, Father. Thank you for this evening's lesson. You mentioned respect earlier. What is a respectful way to discard of paper icons that have folded because of sun exposure? Well, I remember when I was in the Monastery of Essex almost 30 years ago now, 
26 years ago. And um, we took all kinds of old icons like this, went down to the the old church down the road where they had, uh, they dug a hole in the yard there. They put all that in a, in the ditch or whatever they had dug, like the hole in the ground. They burnt it and they buried it. I suppose you could just bury it too, but they burnt it to make it fit in the hole. I guess. Father bless. I have a friend from Romania that left the church to be Pentecostal. And he cites things like clergy wearing gold and churches being rich while people are poor as a reason. How would you respond to this? Uh, I would point out to him that there were similarly scandalized apostles and one particular apostle who really liked to have the money bag and he was scandalized when a lot of very uh, expensive ointment was spread over the body of the Lord and his feet in particular and said that could have been used for the poor and then the Lord turned to that particular apostle and said the poor you will have always with you but you will not have me always with you if the gold and the vestments are used and made to glorify and beautify the temple of God, then we are doing exactly what that woman did to the Lord's body. And there should be no scandal. If we're using that to beautify our bodies, to enrich us, then it is truly a scandal. But in that case, if I poke out uh, or I miss the forest for the tree or I poke out my eye, so to speak, uh, because of somebody else's sin and I don't draw near to Christ in spite of that sinner, then I have, have done nothing good except lose salvation myself. There are plenty of examples of ascetics and saints in our day that your friend can follow. So if he wants to follow the saints and not focus on the sin of some, he can do that. If he wants to be a bee instead of a fly, he can do that. And that's the struggle. Don't walk away from Christ because of the sinner who is not repenting. Repent and draw near to Christ. The question of the Pentecostals has nothing to do with the sin of some clerics or the beauty of the temple. It's so egregious and far from the Christian doctrine, and that's what he should examine. Compare apples and apples. Compare that which is taught and believed by the Pentecostals with that which is taught and believed by the Orthodox, and you'll see that there is a chasm, a huge and insurmountable chasm between Christianity, Christ, the church for 2,000 years received by the apostles and kept in the lives of the saints, lived and shown forth, and the Pentecostals, which are essentially a sectarian creation in the West in reaction to other sectarian heterodox confessions and their delusion on multiple counts at the very heart of what they teach about the Spirit of God, the presence of God, and the understanding of the scriptural passages with regard to Pentecost and all the rest. There's so many errors. So your friend has been duped by the enemy, and he's in delusion. Come back to Christ, the church, the truth, and follow the saints, and you'll have no need of looking at the, um, the speck in your brother's eye so to speak, right? Look at the the plank in your own, and and you have gr grievously departed, and therefore missed the mark. That's what sin means. You've missed the mark of salvation by departing from the body of Christ itself and Christ Himself into a sectarian, delusional, uh, very late what 
19th century uh, creation, which is a human organization and not the organism of God. I don't know. Is that a good answer? What else can we say? Read Elder Cleopa, Truth of Our Faith on the Pentecostals. Read the great elder of Romania. He answered all the questions that were put to him from these various pr Protestant sectarians. Read the Truth of Our Faith, published by Orthodox, by uh, Uncle Mountain Press. He answers all, all of these sectarian uh, challenges. What advice do you have for someone that wants to go deeper but may relocate soon? Continue to study scripture, lives of saints, or visit some local churches. Why would re relocation change anything? I don't understand. Uh, go to the churches, wherever you are, for how, however long you're going to go. Uh, yeah, I don't think relocation shouldn't change any of that. I mean, you're going to be there for six months or six days. It doesn't matter. Go. And where you go next, go go there. Yeah, definitely. All of that's necessary. All of the above is necessary. Continue in it in as much as you can, wherever you are. Father, without saying names, I re heard recently about certain prominent Orthodox Christians getting annoyed about new converts. What madness is this? I don't know. That sounds like madness. I mean, annoyed that they're coming to the church or about something they're doing? It's pretty open-ended there, Helen. I don't know what you're talking about, but... Uh, uh, let's uh, let's help them. That should be the response of any good pastor, right? Father, I want to convert, and I'm aware it will take time. However, I know to convert, I must attend masses, liturgy, and study. We don't attend mass. That's that's a Roman Catholic term. We attend divine liturgy uh, and study. However, I work most Sundays and most holy days. What can I do? So these are practical questions I can't readily answer. But if I, if you were, for instance, in the Phoenix area, you know, if you were in the Phoenix area, then I could tell you, well, come to the monastery. The services start at 1.30 in the morning and they're done by 5. And that way you can go to church on Sunday. But I don't know where you are. It's a practical question. I can't really answer you. But I can simply say you need to do everything you have, you can possibly do to go deeper. And you've got to organize your life so that that's the first thing. You've got to say, is this job really in my best interest? Maybe I need to find a new job. And you're going to say, well, I can't find a new job. I mean, I, this is essential. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Let's pray about it. Let's go to a spiritual father. Let's discern this. Certainly, if we're going to read, if let's say that we died next week, let alone maybe tonight, right? Would we want to be spending the next five days missing all the divine services and not, not participating in the divine liturgy? Probably not, right? So if we live with the urgency and the, con and the and the remembrance of death, we're probably going to organize our life in a different way than we do if we live with the world's needs and demands first and then the things of God second. All right. So having recognized that as the truth for everyone, not just for you. We need to order our life accordingly so that we can then make it to church on Sunday, make it to Vespers and Vigil on Saturday, make it to church on the feast days. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe in three months or six months or even a year or two or whatever it is it takes. But we've got to make that a sincere desire on our part and make it an issue of prayer and go to our spiritual fathers, priest, whatever, and then work toward that. Because that means that shows we're serious about being in communion with God. And then God will change things in such a way you will see because he responds with great philotimo, with great love to everyone who wants to be with him. He will, the obstacles you have now, you say these are insurmountable obstacles. They will, they will disappear and you will be in awe if you put him first and put the divine liturgy and the services and communion with God first. Those obstacles will disappear and you'll be in awe of of how quickly he responded to your good disposition so that's what i would say to that father peter may you please share some advice and counsel for someone who is new to the church and yet feels a future call to the priesthood uh the call to the priesthood needs always to be submitted to the church Submitted to the bishop or priest or spiritual father or elder or whoever it is that's guiding you. 
submitted to God in prayer, and then tested over time. And the church ultimately, in the person of your spiritual father and bishop and future wife, will confirm that. And you will want that confirmation 110%, believe me. You do not want to willfully go into the priesthood. You want to follow the call and test it, and then it needs to be confirmed by third, fourth, and fifth parties, so to speak. In other words, priest, spiritual father, bishop, and wife. So that's how I would deal with that. And and long before I would go to seminary, if I'm a newly illumined, I should not go to seminary anytime soon. Normally, there are exceptions. But I would not suggest anyone go to seminary until they've been in the church for a couple of years, probably, unless there's some real exception and need and the spiritual father just, I don't know, blesses it. But that's the rule. And in those time, in the time in the parish, I would do everything I can to go deeper, get to know the services very well, uh, make progress in my prayer rule, uh, read extensively. Uh, and then I would say, this is my personal opinion and also suggestion to all future priests, people who want to become priests. If you, if you are, if you are ready to be a priest, uh, uh, if you want to be a priest, and you're, but you have to be ready to suffer, ready to be persecuted, ready to be rejected, ready to be uh, thrown out of your parish by your parish council or bishop. You have to be ready in this day and age for all of that and be resigned to the fact that that may be your lot. Because, why do I say that? Because the degree of secularization, the degree of ecumenism in the church today means that that's the lot of most priests. Until uh, such a time that the church has a council and does away with the legitimacy of being an ecumenist and an orthodox bishop, priest, and all the rest. So, and other, and other isms. So you've got to be ready for that. And if you go into the priesthood and you say, look, you know, I like the priesthood, but I'd like to have a good salary. You know, I'd like to be able to have a nice house. I'd like to be able to, you know, settle down and have, you know, take my kids to baseball practice. And if that's kind of how you're thinking about the priesthood, like I'm a priest, but hey, not too much, then I'd probably say either change that mind real quick or don't go and pursue the priesthood. What we we def desperately need young men who are you know, have, have maintained their sobriety and chastity and are serious and humble. And all of this, all, the church needs desperately to have her future priest. But if you're not ready to suffer and be persecuted, I don't know if it's a good idea to be a priest today. I don't know. I think you may be getting into trouble. Uh, there's, uh, a, it's wrought with the temptations and difficulties today to be a priest. Brother Peter, here's what are the types of martyrdom, or is there any? Is there a martyrdom in marriage? So martyrdom, martyria in Greek, it means witness. There, of course, you know the martyrdom of blood, right? That we give our life for Christ. We become martyrs in that sense. But there, those martyrs were first martyrs in their life to the presence and witness and grace of God. Before they were martyrs in blood, they were martyrs to the way and and Christ lived in them, as it says in the in the gospel, that he witnesses in us, he confesses in us, and then we become witnesses and confessors. So first and foremost, every Christian, ideally, normally, is a martyr. He's a witness. He's a witness like the apostles were witnesses to Christ. They can say, we were eyewitnesses of the word, right? So so every Christian is, is, a, is a witness, a martyr to Christ. Secondly, there's the martyrdom of blood that we talked about. There's also the martyrdom of asceticism and asceticism, the bloodless martyrdom, but it's with much tears and many uh, and much sweat and uh, and you know a bloodletting without shedding. Uh, in the monastic life. Uh, so 
there's those that's also a kind of martyrdom there's martyrdom short of uh, uh of uh, of blood martyrdom uh, through a confession of the faith in which one suffers exile or imprisonment or rejection or any kind of persecution that's a kind of martyria right a kind of witness to christ so i would say those are all kinds of martyrdom a martyrdom in marriage well there's a martyrdom in marriage in the sense that you are you you're killing you're killing your will you're laying it laying it down your life for your uh for christ in your wife or husband right that's the type that marriage is referred to by paul is to christ and the church and so you're struggling to lay down your life for your wife and children in the sense of giving your life giving your your time effort your whole uh, strength and 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 um, and time and energy for the sake of Christ in your wife and children, and that could be a kind of witness to Christ in your life in the marriage. So, yeah, you could probably talk about martyrdom in marriage. I'm not sure what you have in mind. Maybe you think more along the lines of suffering because you don't have. Somebody who loves you in marriage? I don't know. What are you, what are you talking about? It's hard to say. Um, there, there's a there's long suffering. In, in many marriages, there's a lot of long suffering that has to go through. We have to suffer in silence and suffer patiently with the passions of our husband or wife or uh, maybe even their delusion. Uh, that would be a long kind of martyrdom uh, for, the, for her sake or his sake to come back to Christ or to make progress in and come closer to Christ, there's certainly, certainly, that would be a kind of martyrdom. All right, um, the boomer grandma has a question: Does this requirement about no fornication after fornication after baptism apply to becoming a deacon too, or only the priesthood? Uh, I believe canonically it also applies to the diaconate. Yes, that's my understanding. You don't you don't get ordained directly to the priesthood. You pass through it and you go to the diaconate and then the priesthood. And so therefore, it's the priesthood is not just the priesthood, strictly speaking. It's the whole process, right? It really begins when you become a reader and then a subdeacon and then a deacon and a priest. All of this is considered basically the priesthood. And so before you begin on this track and you and you begin to you know go through these stages, you're going to have a long sit down with your spiritual father and you're going to go to confession. You're going to discuss all that. That's the norm. That's the norm, right? Uh, are there exceptions? There are. They're very rare and with much trepidation. Trepidation, And depending on who you talk to, you'll get different answers today. I'm trying to be as honest as possible and represent the whole reality of the church today. If we were to be more strict and stick with Athenite fathers and all the rest, then you can imagine it's not they're not going to really be open to that path. And I think that's a that's the best path, although there are exceptions, even among Athenites. Uh, so that's the norm. That's the Krivia. And that's that's the vast majority. There might be exceptions occasionally. I don't know. I'm not I'm not a bishop to make those calls or. I never had a spiritual child that, that was in that position to become a priest. So I can't speak from experience about the exceptions. How should catechism behave? Catechism behave. Can they, cate, catechumens, I think you want to say. How should catechumens behave? Can they continue in sexual relationships outside of marriage? Of course not. Of course not. The minute you become a catechumen, you uh, put that all behind you. That's fornication. That's totally inconsistent with the life in Christ. That is, uh, you you are basically mocking and and the whole catechumen at that point. Now, are you struggling with that and you need help? Okay, that's a different. But you're struggling with it. Okay, that's that means that you're going to the priest. You're confessing it. At least that's that's a good beginning, and that's that humility and that, that, that desire for repentance is it could become a, a new beginning. Uh, the way you're asking it, it sounds like is are we look we're looking for an ability to do both? That's why I reacted 
the way I did. Um, if somebody wants and is asking, can I do this and be a catechumen? The answer is absolutely not. Cornelius, which economic, I mean, the whole process of the catechumen is to put off the old way, right? In the, old, in the ancient church, they would go three years to put off all the pagan promiscuity, the pagan ways, you know. Today, we, we're worse than the pagans in many places. We're worse than the pagans because the pagans believed in some higher power. They believed in submitting to God of some sort. Today, we have, most people don't even think, them, think, think of themselves as God in, in the making or something. So we need to put off the old man. That's the whole point of the catechumen. If we're not doing that, then what are we doing? Why are we catechumen? At least try. You got to struggle to do it. Which economic anal analyst have you been following about CBDCs? Edward Doward, indeed. That's one of them. Richard Werner? I don't know Richard Werner, no. I find Edward Dowd, I don't, I'm not, hey, don't listen to me. I don't know much about these issues. I'm not a pro, but I find him to be pretty uh, down to earth and simple. And I, and um, yeah, I like what he, I like what I saw so far. Helen Constantino, another, another question. You've got a lot of questions. I think we need to limit to three questions per person because we could be here all night and it is going on two hours and 45 minutes. So we got to, we got to wrap it up here. Father Peter, do ghosts exist? I'm, I don't mean demons tricking, but actual phantoms of people once lived. No, they do not. Those are demonic appearances. Orthodox law. Okay. Can we ask a nuanced question? I hope so. Questions are nuanced. That's, those are good questions. Father, when one is pure in spirit, how does a man approach a woman to properly court in a Christian sense? Shall a man simply go and ask the woman out, etc.? Good question. Thank you for the nuanced question. Ideally, traditionally, someone who is seeking marriage would be through the community, through the spiritual father, through the priest, through the mother, through the father, through a third party, a common friend. That's how things work the best, that we have someone who is older and wiser that says you know you two might want to consider you know getting to know each other because if you're both interested in marriage and you're both orthodox and you want to live this life i've i know both of you and i think you would you might you know do well together or a spiritual father would say that or an abbess of a monastery would say that or we would be in a very good environment of church environment a monastic environment a community where the people are struggling for virtue and we would have opportunities, uh, modest opportunities of interaction with the with the, uh, opposite sex. And in that, you know, friendly environment, we would be able to get to slightly know better some other people. And then might say, may we spend more time together. But dating, dating is not a traditional Orthodox way of doing things. I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm just saying it's not what people did for most of the history of the church. There wasn't any of this dating going on. My mother-in-law and father-in-law, uh, she was 17 and he was 25, I think. And her relatives said, hey, I know this fine young man. And and his relatives said, I know this fine young lady and you ought to meet. And they met one day in some house somewhere. I don't remember. I think her, his mother's house maybe or something. And they said, this is, uh, this is who we think we should, you should marry. And uh, she said, okay. And he said, okay. And it was pretty much an arranged marriage. And they lived, you know, well together throughout their life. To me, that's a, that's a testimony to the older generation and their virtues, not a testimony to the perfection of that system. It's not a testimony to that every marriage worked out well, but it's a testimony to the simplicity and virtue of the older generation. And we are so egotistical today, so proud, so arrogant, so picky. And it just makes it harder to find somebody and harder to live and harder to save our souls. 
So uh, anyway, getting back to what you said, I think that's that's ideal. Now, going forward, there's a lot of unique circumstances and we don't have opportunities many times to meet other young people who want to be married. Uh, and so some people have to go to great lengths. I don't know. I'm not trying to say this is, you know, this has to be the way. I'm just saying that's traditionally how things work. There's a community in which we live and there are people in that community who uh, put people together and and there's a lot in common. The people who come together have a lot in common already so they can focus on the one thing needful and working out their salvation together. That's usually how a good marriage uh, is uh, is. That's the ideal, right? To, to work, we want to be with that person because we're going to work out our salvation with that person. That's the point of marriage. Children, love, but salvation first and foremost. Orthodox Law, thank you very much for your donation. God bless you. Justin, what are example situations in which lay people should bother to correct the priest if they have been wrong? Recently, a priest told me that St. Cyril Methodius communed with Catholics. Wow, that is wrong. Where did he get that? If it's matters of faith and you have a personal relationship with the priest and are in good terms, then I would say that you know, depending on the boldness that you feel toward that priest, you should go and approach him and say, Father, you ought to read this text or you ought to consider this whatever, you know, and 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 go ahead with it as a out of brotherly love. And if the priest is humble, he's not going to see himself as somehow above it. And God help him if he if he's that if he sees himself above correction. Uh, if you have a priest who's not well disposed to being corrected, then you give them the witness once if it's a clear heretical mindset and you, and they're doing things in a humanist heretical way, then you need at least once to give the witness. And if there's no response, then you need to to, to, to either depart or or at least remain silent and pray. Uh, but uh, layman's the layman job is not necessarily to play the bishop over the, the priest, obviously. That's not the role. The role is the con to be the conscience of the church and to be the, the the children of the father. But the children of the father sometimes are going to tell the father, you know what, you're not doing well. And a good father is going to say, thank you. Because you as children see things that I don't see as the father. And I need you to tell me. And, I, and we're one body. And I need, we're worked together for one another. And we need to ask forgiveness of one another and all that. That's how... A father and a, and children should work together, whether it be in the parish or in the family. We should be asking forgiveness of one another and receiving one another's rebuke, ideally. So that means that there's a role for the layman to do that, but it's got to be done with much prayer, and humility, and restraint. Yeah. Are the church lack? Is the church lacking a good bishop or clergy because? I noticed the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Well, ain't that the truth? Thank you very much for that. Couldn't agree more. The, the, the last part, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Although there are more and more laborers. I mean, I've been Orthodox since 1991, 32 year, 31 years now, 32 years almost. And I have to say that a lot's changed. And a lot, the church has grown tremendously and it's growing faster than ever. So thank God for that. In America, at least. Father Bless, can a person who has been married and divorced as a Protestant and then baptized Orthodox become a priest? I think the vast majority of people would say yes, but stricter interpreters and commentators would say no. And I think it really de it would depend on the witness. See, the whole thing behind this question is what is the witness of the priest? So let's say that if, so, you know, most priests were coming from communities and, and in that community, they married or were, or, and, and were given in marriage. So in a community, if you end up getting divorced, obviously you're not going to have a face to witness to the community anymore. I mean, you have to be and the people they want as their priest are exceptional, right? They're above all of this. And then therefore they can speak to it all. And people 
will look to them as an authority. So the church is not interested in putting people in positions of spiritual authority who have shown themselves to be spiritually inadequate and 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 improper. And so their witness to the community is what the church is really concerned about, right? So in this case, it's it kind of could go either way, it, 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 depending on the, the discernment of the bishop and the and the priest or the spiritual father, I should say. Um, and generally speaking, I think most people would say before baptism, whatever happened is washed away and done away, and so therefore it's not an it's not an obstacle to the priesthood. Others would say, well, yes, but in this community, that witness that is known to the people is going to undermine his priesthood, and so it's wisely it's best to avoid because you also put yourself in a very difficult situation, and you yourself will suffer because how can I now speak to this? potential divorcee when I divorced, right? How, how can I guide somebody when I himself, uh, myself have fallen into the same sins and have not proven to be uh, uh, trustworthy? That's the thinking behind the people who would say, better not. The others would say, well, yes, all that was before baptism. And so therefore pre, you know, pre-Christ. And so it doesn't, we don't consider it. I can see it going either way. Probably the latter, the one I just mentioned, is is the majority view that it's it's possible to become a priest because of baptism, washing everything away. Another reason why we need we need to have people baptized. There's a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. Stephanie, should we talk to family or friends that are atheist about the Bible, or is this only the role for the priest? Of course, you should talk to people as witnessing to Christ. Um, but a, a, your question is a little weird about the Bible. Why would you talk to atheists about the Bible? What you should, do they respect the Bible? Do they love the Bible? Why would you talk to them about the Bible? I would say, talk to them about Christ, about the meaning of life. Talk to them about, about uh, you know, but mostly don't talk to them about much if they don't have a good disposition. But show your by your life that, that Christ is real and 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 God, uh, first and foremost. Secondly, pray fervently. Third, if you do things, in, do it in such a way that you ask them questions. You don't tell them things. You ask them questions so that they can consider it themselves. People who have a, do not have a good disposition, we ask questions of them. We don't tell them what they need to hear because they're not going to be well disposed to being told they need to do X, Y, Z. Not a good idea. So you ask questions. And in, in, you offer experiences, stories, indirectly. You don't go and try, when people are not well disposed, to, you know, in any way force them uh, toward Christ. Christ doesn't do that, so you shouldn't either. Uh, but you should definitely be a good witness to them in word and deed. All right, I think that's the last question, unless we have something over... In Crowdcast, we have a bunch of questions. Crowdcast, but we our time is up, unfortunately, folks. We've got another four minutes, and then we're out uh, automatically over at Orthodox Ethos because it's a three-hour limit. Uh, try to quickly answer one or two questions here. What would be an appropriate action to take if altar girls were introduced at one's parish? Oh, Lord have mercy. Um, seek guidance from your spiritual father. Pray fervently, and then if you have a blessing, approach and submit the holy tradition and why that's not a good idea. Father, bless. How do we ask the saints to intercede for us? What's the best initial approach? There are so many. We, Lord Jesus Christ, um, you know, I mean, sorry, we go to the icon and we would say, Holy Father John, pray to God for us. St. John, intercede for us. We would, we could say that the form of Jesus' prayer, essentially, Lord Jesus Christ, instead of Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. St. John, pray to God for us. You can say that uh, 33 times if you'd like. You can actually have prayers. There's prayers written to the saints. There's just your own impromptu uh, in your heart to ask and talk to the saint. Uh, the saint is alive in God, and you're asking in God and through God for that saint to intercede and god is the messenger so to speak and he desires 
us to be in communion with not only himself, but all who are in communion with him. And he desires all of us to help one another on the path of salvation. That's what he desires for us. And so that's why we go to the saints and they're alive. And especially the ones who are recent, who we knew and we know through their uh, disciples, uh, they play a, a, an important role as well. Another question, if I may, thinking about giving rights to the evil one, what happens in a house blessing? And do you recommend them? Of course. We bless the house. When we move in, we get the holy water. We come over and do the service of blessing of the holy water, and we bless the whole house. Why? That is very uh, basic, a basic thing that we do when we go to a new house. Father, blessed with AI, it would be easy to fake a resurrection. I'm wondering if people may doubt the resurrection of the prophets and not necessarily fear. Eh, I don't know. I don't think anybody's ever thought about that. Certainly, Elder Athanasius would not have known that, so I don't know what to say to that. Um, we'll see if they doubt it. But they do not doesn't seem like that. The Scripture certainly doesn't say that they doubted it, so I'm not sure why we would posit that. I mean, we'll see, I guess, when that time comes. Father, uh, your blessing. Is it possible for us to take any English lesson online? Any English lesson online at the seminary in Thessalonica? Oh, do they offer do they offer theological lessons in English? I think they do, actually. I think they do, but I don't know much about that. You'd have to look it up. Last question, and we're out. Father, secularism in the Western spirit has done much to poison the well of marriage with what with casual sex, birth control, social media hookups, legalistic issues that many are deterred from, from it and have un, an unrealistic... Uh, what happened? Somebody took that question away as I was reading it. I guess that means you don't want me to answer it. Okay, no worries. All right, God bless. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, we just lost the Wix destination, so now we're 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 down to uh, the Orthodox Ethos destination. A lot of questions tonight. Hopefully, I've answered to your satisfaction. We will see you again on Thursday for the question and answer session. Otherwise, two weeks from the night. We'll be back. All right. We're out. We chant the Traparian and we're out for the night. God bless you. Good Holy Week and Pascha to all of you if I don't see you. So, son, kiri, and ton laon, so, kev long, ye son, din cleronomi, and so, ni, kanti, vasi, lefsi, katavar, varon, dorumenos. Keton son filaton, dia tu stavrusu politema. Through the prayers of the Holy Father, Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. <laughs> Give
αγία τους μόχλους τους αιωνίους συντρίψας και δεσμάδια ρίξας του μνήματος ανέστης κατά λοιπόν σου τα Oh, the sea, me, no, God. 